our receipts. <laughs> but because I enjoy it, I think to myself, no, I shouldn't take time to do that right now. I should go and do one of those tasks that I really don't love doing. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, so it's like the joy know. is something that causes the guilt and then you're like, like I'm not allowed I to have a, enjoy my life. Not until all of the work is done. Is that is that German? Where do we get that? I, I don't what did know. we get? <laughs> until all the Why? work is done, but it's actually work that you're needing to do. What right? And then it piles up, and then it's like this mountainous task where you're like, "Ooh, right. I have four loads of laundry right. to fold now." Right. Because I didn't just allow myself that little bit of dessert of sitting down and folding laundry. Right. I love and then, folding this laundry. is this is insane. <laughs> I, like I have four loads of laundry to do because I didn't let myself enjoy folding the laundry, even though I wanted to so bad. I stopped. I held it off, and now I have to eat. You know, I, like and what, now we're digging through laundry piles trying to, to find, find stuff, our so socks. it becomes like less just, enjoyable at that part. You've made the task, yeah. you know, just kind of kind of needlessly. So let's apply it not difficult. to me, but to you, like. You don't need to have a switch. You just need to know that God has blessed you with this ability, this desire, and so do it. God has blessed me with the desire to organize and sort, and so do it. Allow yourself that moment. It's not gluttonous to just do it for a moment. And maybe that's it. Maybe maybe it's the gluttonous side of us that's like, well, since it's only 15 minutes, it's not really worth my time to stop well, and do it. There, there's no only 15 minutes in not writing. Not in writing. It's there, true. Yeah, it's, it's like, because it's only two and a half to five hours that I well, need today. Well, and maybe right? so, that's the thought, though. Like, maybe if you thought of it more of it as a 15-minute mm-hmm. task. Like, you know, what? it's just a little task on my to-do list. I'm just going to get it done. Yeah. You would allow yourself that well, and, more uh, often. Well, applying the smart note approach to the fiction as i've been trying to do has enabled that although it hasn't fixed the smart note book um (laughs) because the the smart note book is written is just on six by four cards as one sentence per card and i need to still go through probably two-thirds of it and put it in order and that's um that requires space which brings me back to like like this space isn't enough space or I'm using this space for other things, and mm-hmm. so it's not ready for that. And then, you know, the kitchen table is, has been where I've done it when I've gotten to. But um, Well, maybe, maybe we could go get some tables from church and just set them up, like, over at the chrysalis ooh, in the basement. Ooh, that would work. Or, oh, sorry, chrysalis is another word that we use for the, the Hebron Collegium. Collegium. Mm-hmm. <laughs> That's our kind of... I don't know. Is that like the insider word? <laughs> well, it was the original plan. So as things continue to like develop at the Hebrew Collegium, you know, old ideas like the chrysalis. What a place does that for, say for our podcasters? Oh, it says, held up yeah, a, a well, note card. the chrysalis plan. Uh, don't make plans. Take note, learn, give. Um, there's uh, there's another document like that one about the chrysalis that's even older, uh, focusing on like actual concept of a hospitality house in the area for young men to discover uh, uh, solitude, uh, uh, recommitment of themselves to what they believe is essential for the future of their life as a man, as a Christian in America. Um, And and this has become the Gap Year Bible School for Men, a semi-monastic year or three months, whatever you'd like, to uh, set a trajectory for a righteous life with some hands-on training. You can build a chicken coop. Well, actually, it's done. Almost. (laughs) Almost. almost. Um, But, you know, a gentleman exploring uh, recently just for a couple of days Mm -hmm. and uh, got to help out with that. So uh, the chrysalis, though, was the original name of it, thinking it as... um, a place for metamorphosis, a place yeah. for regeneration, a place to come in as one thing and go out as another thing. Um, definitely a Christian symbol that the butterfly, a symbol of Easter is not out of the Bible, but it's a symbol that has been adopted by the church over time. Um, and it may, it may be connected to Jesus, uh, transfiguration indeed being a metamorpho. And I think it was just this past week in Romans 12 that I mentioned metamor- metamorpho. Yeah, I did. I did. Uh, that, that you're, mm-hmm. uh, by the metamorpho of your mind, right? Uh, and, uh, that this is your, your spiritual, your logical worship, <laughs> uh, yeah. is to metamorph your mind. Um, 
so anyway, that, that was but just the can... initial concept. Yeah. And so when I was at first praying for this, you know, dear Jesus, give me my neighbor's house. What a prayer. <laughs> my neighbor wanted to sell the house. So I just wanted to be able to buy the house. And it's all been kind of amazing how that's worked out. Um, this, I was, we just I, get to be the landlords. Like we I didn't pull it out of my pocket. I'll tell you that. <laughs> uh, so, uh, but as we've done that and, and it's congealed from not sure hospitality house, publishing house, a bunch of other ideas. And some of that's still there. Um, how do we name this thing based on the lore of the Bible as opposed to just sort of like uh, an idea? So, so the chrysalis mm-hmm. is the concept, um, but the Hebron Collegium is trying to take some lore of the Bible that oh, you've heard the word Hebron before, but what is that story or lots of stories about? And you mm-hmm. should do a little search on Hebron. It's it's quite a place. Um, Oaks of Mamre, ring a bell. Uh, so uh, so that's where the name shifted. And so I've moved more into that. The family still has the chrysalis as a, as a concept. And, and that's fine. I mean, it's, it's okay to have it be that too um, in a sort of like social or, or um, mm-hmm. you know. Uh, it's more slang. Like that's slang our slang context. word. Right, right, right. <laughs> because we've been instructed that it's Hebron or it's the Hebron Collegium. And so if you put the at the beginning, it's like the, uh, uh, and then you just say chrysalis. Yeah, and, okay, yeah, yeah. Because the chrysalis works and <laughs> the Hebron does not work because Hebron is a place. Okay, so, so Hebron, is that is that where Sarah was buried too? Yeah. There's lots that goes on at Hebron. Yeah. Hebron's essential to the Old Testament lore. Uh, all the way down through, I mean, David has interactions there. Um, I, I don't know about later kings, but I'm pretty confident it shows up later in the kings yeah, as well. Mm-hmm. But definitely from Abraham starts out there. Uh, mm-hmm. th- I'm pretty sure it's where three men show up to talk to him. Oh, so Isaac is prophesied foretold. of there. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And then they, they have a burial place that they purchase from someone, um, uh, Mamre, I believe. Uh, but I, again, for Sarah. Yes, initially, right. But and then, then does Abraham... Abraham goes Abraham back, Isaac goes back, Jacob goes back. They all there? get buried there. Mm-hmm. Oh, It's this okay. burial place of the patriarchs. Very good. And then I uh, forget what David does there. So I, I, well, part of the reason I pick some of these names is so that I will remember them and learn them too. Hebron is just so big, yeah. right? So as opposed to Jacob and Boaz, which are just two of the rooms in the building, like that's really much faster to, to remember. Although if I had to tell you which one's which in terms of their translation, I wouldn't have that down hmm. yet either. It's, he establishes and the Lord will strengthen. Uh, and they are the pillars of the temple um, that hmm. Solomon named. These huge pillars. Boaz is a good name. And Boaz is a good name. I believe that's... He strengthens but Ah! <laughs> <laughs> Again, so have to look it well, up. and this these will be on um, those parts when we get the the names on the doors and stuff that Chloe's working on. Um, mm-hmm. We should have the translation there, so it's That's good. really clear. Yeah, yeah. And then the guest room penule is uh, the face of God. That's Jacob's ladder. That's where. Uh, no, I'm sorry, I'm wrong. It's not Jacob's ladder. It's uh, Jacob at the Javik. It's when um, Jacob oh, wrestles with God. Oh, his hip gets yeah. all dislocated, yeah. and yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah, but he comes out. A Christian, yeah, right? and so, uh, yeah, yeah, chrysalis. We got off on that as a tangent. Yeah, just because I thought maybe you could spread out some large tables, in um, in maybe the threshing floor, which is where we're going to have the. Oh, I would enjoy jujitsu mat. Yeah, it's really cool. Like temperature wise yeah it holds Oddly. for how hot it is yeah, it's all that pavement it's all that pavement and then the and open open air space yeah. and um it holds its night cool it does pretty well and so there's that and then there's down in the basement area that that which uh, is threshing floor is exciting. is almost entirely filled with wood that now, needs to dry oh. a little bit i know <laughs> but they're nice it pieces of so wood though clean but I know it's I know. An, it's a process we have to redo the walls so it's going to get dirty again yeah. anyway right Right, right. So, hey, uh, if, if you know of a young man, uh, and I, I know I've told you, you know, regular viewers, regular listeners, uh, you are aware of this, but um, we really do need to get the word out as much as possible through you to others. Um, if you know of a young man who isn't quite sure what he wants to do right now, I mean, I think of me actually at this point. I remember mm-hmm. I graduated from college mm-hmm. with my English degree. <laughs> my creative writing degree still want to write um and i did not know what to do and my mom's like be a missionary teach english overseas and that was it was good i met my wife and stuff but but in terms of 
if I had to think through um, why that happened, it wasn't because I chose to do that. I was just mm-hmm. being pushed. I yeah. was just following whatever was whatever, right? And the goal of Hebron is like, hey, how about you you sit down for, for a little bit and work this one out with some good conversation with some other Christian men and an older Christian man who can kind of see a little further than you. Um, and yeah, it's not going to cost you much at all, you know, no. to do this. Um, so. Well, and, and the, the visitor that we recently had, had gone on a very like straight and narrow trajectory, gotten his BA mm-hmm. and then gone out in the field and been like, what? Mm-hmm. <laughs> this is not something I can do the rest of my life and so then headed on to get um, a master's of divinity Mm. and then was like just I need a break yeah I need five minutes to like catch my breath because of different things coming at him and so that's essentially his goal is still to get the master's of divinity but um but if he comes to Hebron, which it sounds like he wants to, it yeah, would be... He's on his way. Yeah. He's got a, a, a landing date. It would be just for a, a five-minute break. Yeah. To, well, one year, five-minute yeah. break. But yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, and to and learn a little Hebrew, so, uh, which is uh, yeah. uh, exciting. I mean, I teach <laughs> Hebrew uh, Wednesday afternoons, and uh, uh, so he's pretty excited about that, I think. Yeah, one of um, the conversations we had as we were putting the chicken coop together was hey do you think i could coordinate a hunting trip (laughs) it was like Mm. (laughs) let's talk about that later yeah Yeah. you can i mean can you coordinate that yes if you have an if you have an a desire and you actually put it all together and get it all lined up that it, now, that's we, kind we of just turned nature. off every mom out there because firearms came into the conversation oh. <laughs> and firearms in the wilderness came into the conversation. So the, the real question is, Lizard you know, hunting. yeah, how, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. bow hunting. Yeah. Um, bow hunting is a thing. Uh, so, but, but it's just, it's one of those places though, for young men to be able to ask that question. So the, the mother's heart doesn't shut them down mm-hmm. where it's like, you said hunting. Mm-hmm. Don't ever talk about that. It's like, mm-hmm. no, let's figure this out. What would it take to and, coordinate a hunting trip? And to do it wisely, safely with someone who knows what they're doing and has mm-hmm. done it before, right? right. Uh, who can, a uh, mentor, right? How do you find Right, I said there are several guys in our in our congregation who go on hunting trips regularly. Um, mm-hmm. And I'm, I'm thinking like, okay, Wisconsin, Honestly, North Dakota. Honestly, <laughs> putting out the word through this, I mean, we're not doing it officially, but hey, any pastors out there on your mm-hmm. annual hunting trip, you want to take a few guys with you? Um, there's a lot of... A lot of hunters in the yeah. roster of the Missouri Synod. Oh, yeah. yeah. So, it's especially okay. in the Midwest. Yeah. Head up to South Dakota, do some of that pheasant. That'd be interesting. That's a whole different kind of hunting. Yeah. A little shotgun Well, action. and deer, too. I mean, that's ruminant meat. Yeah. Yay. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, with with our desire to be eating more ruminant meat, um, beef, bison, deer, uh, having somebody say, hey, I want to do a hunting trip, it was like, absolutely <laughs> fill the freezer fill the freezer up. Yeah, you, you actually you really must um i got in trouble once for saying the word catch you can't you don't catch something when you hunt you really must get something get i don't know catching is what you do with fish i guess oh, okay okay so i was like did you catch anything and the guy just like looked at me <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, well I, what, what is that? just wrestled it right yeah, Down right, to the yeah ground. right wrestled it this is good that's good so um yeah it, 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 if you know of a guy uh, who needs some space and uh wants to be good the rest of his life serve the church serve his family serve his community uh this is just a out of this world opportunity uh for uh, pennies on the dollar in terms of uh you know your collegiate education and, and all mm-hmm. that so um all that came out of talking about me wanting to write silly you fiction books. You needing to spread your books. Oh yeah, that's right, that's right. So, so, it can get so done. doing that over in the threshing floor section, that would be that would be interesting. Because where else could it be? Nowhere really else could it be. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Not yeah. I mean, if you were to really have the next two weeks, which is kind of funny, we have this summer break. I could just do it on the there. on the central table over there yeah. over the next two weeks. You, that's true. But part, I mean, it's like next week. You could do it. Yeah, because week. I'm gone the week then after. You're gone at higher things, Valparaiso. So if you're going to Valpo, there. come say hi. Yeah, come. not me, just Jonathan. Yeah, come come <laughs> tell me how much you like us, <laughs> and uh, uh, and all that. 
Um, if you do like us, you can find more at refhis.com. And especially if you want to ask questions for the show, because your questions, Bible answers, are nonsense is how this works, uh, refhis.com slash contact. And if you like supporting us, want to keep doing that, thank you very much if you do. If you'd like to start, subscribe, star.com slash revfisk or patreon.com slash revfisk. Subscription model is how the wheels stay on this this Jeep. Uh, so inside, inside, uh, the wheels are fine. That only costs thirty three dollars. That's the only part that's fine. That those two bolts only were thirty three bucks. It's just the transmission. Oh, it's the man. transmission. That's that's an issue. So anyway, um, we'll leave that story for another time. But I can tell you that uh, Matt, uh, the Stop the White Nose. I can tell you you found Stop the White Nose with Jonathan and Meredith. I'm Jonathan, and I'm Meredith. And Jesus Christ has risen from the dead. That makes you paid for. That makes you immortal. Now he's not going to be long anyway. Stop the White Noise is brought to you by Mad Christianity. You can find out more at madpxm.com. And, of course, brought to you by the Hebron Collegium, like we were just talking about, Hebron Collegium, C-O-L-L-E-G-I-U-M dot com for more information there. Um, and I think that's all I need to do for advertisements at the moment. Um, Funny story. I was over at the Hebron Collegium watering the various plants that we have growing in pots. And... Um, one of them happens to be a cabbage plant. So <laughs> I looked at it and it was getting full. It was like riddled with holes. It really doesn't look like a cabbage plant. It looks like a cabbage skeleton. But so I started doing a little research and flipping over research. I started flipping over the leaves. <laughs> research. I was researching. <laughs> Discovery, I think, is the correct word. <laughs> Discovery. That's the official, like, yeah. like management word. I made a hypothesis, and then I did an experiment. Oh, there you go. And I flipped over some leaves and found the culprits, all these little green worms. Mm -hmm. And so I just started pulling them off and putting them in my hand. That's fun. <laughs> and I'm proud of you. <laughs> You can wash your hands. And Did you hear about the slug? You heard about that I slug. Heard about Did the they get slug. it off the I don't know. wood? I oh. should have. It was, it was, a, that was big slug. It was big and there it was, was like slug translucent yesterday. yellow. Oh, like it was, was weird. Was it a banana and, slug? That's odd to have banana it, slugs. It happening. looked like something from a deep, dark cave <laughs> with like poisonous gelatinous. It was disgusting. It was horrid. And then they put salt on it and it, they all went. It, yeah. I heard my son was like. The, what was it? The bubbles were like mushrooms coming out of it. And I was like, <laughs> Ugh. So um, <laughs> you were saying something about green worms. Anyway, which... the, the green worms, I piled them into my hand oh. and brought them home. And, um, and our youngest was like, can we put them in a jar with some lettuce? Oh, yeah. And we were growing lettuce in our yard for sweet rabbit, of course. And so we put them in a jar with the lettuce and a little stick and... We have like three chrysalis now. That's pretty cool. <laughs> so chrysalis. Chrysalis from the chrysalis. Yeah. <laughs> It'll turn out they're like some kind of awful moth. I know. You know, flesh, flesh eating <laughs> moth or something. Um, yeah. Yeah. I don't know what they're going to turn into. We got a question right out of the viewership right away. And oh, so I want to just hi. take it as a good kickoff because it's it's good. Any advice that uh, Brian says, any advice on teaching God's word to my son who's two and a half years old? Mm -hmm. Right now, uh, I read him board books of Christian hymns from Gloria, Gloria, Gloria Publishing. Not not familiar with Gloria Publishing, mm -hmm. but um, advice on two and a half year old catechesis. Two and a half year old. Um, like the board books are good, but honestly, you can, you can just get the... The catechism and read it, uh, the repetitive nature of it is so lovely for children. So if you, um, like, it's not that the, the catechism itself is repetitive, but just going over the Ten Commandments and what does this mean over and over mm -hmm. again is, it's comforting to them. Also, the Lord's Prayer, then they hear it on Sunday morning and they join in. It's so so cute <laughs> but a blessing to all those who mm -hmm. hear it mm -hmm. as well when a small child says the lord's prayer and then amen in their really loud and innocent um shameless voice shameless is a little better than innocent <laughs> uh, so um yeah that made me think like why not just a regular hymnal and then but same hymns mm -hmm. right so pick your favorite hymns read them out loud 
kind of have them follow along uh, with the finger. We always did that with the mm-hmm. hymnal. Yeah, so you um, hold their hand and actually have them point to the words you are saying. And they go... <laughs> yeah. It, they get all like <laughs> nervous and excited. They're not sure what's going on. It's, it's fun. But then over time, they'll actually give you their hand. Like, point point for me. Where mm-hmm. are we? So that's kind of a neat little yeah. thing. Um, and then... Reading the Bible, if you're doing the Sons of Solomon prayers, just read them with your son. Mm -hmm. Um, Have Mm -hmm. that be part of your time together. And then he will memorize them faster than you will. Yeah. Yeah. So it's you'll hear him just at at the dinner table or playing with his Legos or blocks or whatever he's playing with and saying them. So, yeah, this is a place where I have been less skilled as a human. Um, than I would like to be. And so, you know, I'm a little, yeah. I'm a little, thanks. <laughs> well, no, I just, I, it's true though. Sorry. It's true though. It's just the way that it was. I, yeah. Well, I had five thoughts go through my head and it was like, yeah, yeah. just. Well, I, I didn't have heavy. any modeling from, right. from my family. And so trying to figure out how to do it while overcoming certain emotional barriers to that yes. um, has been something that I only realized I needed to do like a year ago. And so, you know, I, I think we're making headway, but, um, uh, I, point is I, I have to recuse myself on judgment day from setting myself as a master on how to teach sons when they're two and a half. Cause I, I missed my boat here. Right. So, um, my son's doing pretty well and, uh, working on that He's relationship. He's always but. been hungry for the faith. So, I mean, I don't know if you, if when we name our children, we are divinely inspired. I don't know that we can say that, but it seems that our children. <laughs> Keep going. You got me going here. Uh-oh. It seems that our children do kind of embody that that name, whatever we've given. So the one who is named after baptism, Trinity Promise, that is constantly something that we get to remind her mm. of. Hmm. And the one who is praise the Lord in the highest, Alleluia Excelsis, is like she <clears throat> she exudes praise, she brings praise, she's Sunshine and Marshmallow. She is it, we are so thankful yeah. that we were given her. Yeah. Um and yeah. the one that is named fruitful one, oh, Ooh, is created it? By God. Is it created? I was like, oh, it's not mm-hmm. fa- whose father is God, no, is it? That's... And I get them mixed up. Mm-hmm. So, fruitful one created by God mm-hmm. is just wants so badly to be fruitful mm. and be a mother, and yet at the same time, um, needs to know that you were created by God. You, He has you. And resurrected one whose father is God. That's like a reminder to us. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Anastasia Aviella, like this child is so strong and so her own person that he, she is God's child. Like we mm. we cannot cling to her because from the time she was teeny, it was like struggles. I'm going to help. risk my life yeah, today. Yep, yep. <laughs> risk, but then also just the then stuff that she was born with that has caused yeah, yeah, struggle yeah, yeah. and trial and us to constantly be like, okay, Lord, yeah. here she is. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and then um, faith undying. So our our son, who you were bemoaning that you didn't get to form as mm-hmm. a two year old. I I just can't did. be one who gives advice in this in, in this right. question without acknowledging that I, I don't think I was the master at that time. I don't think I have done this well. And God be praised, the vocation that you have mm-hmm. as pastor mm-hmm. saw him teaching the faith constantly. Mm-hmm. And so he grew up doing the the typical I want to be like father where, you know, we were having we were having service and he was serving communion and he and communion was always the big part of his service. Mm-hmm. Like that has been a huge part of his um what he sees as faith and and the central point of yeah. the service yeah. and yeah. and so now he, he just recently got to partake for the first time so that's so his name faith undying fides athanasius is it's like 
yeah, they just kind of embody their their name. So I opened it up and got you going. So <laughs> well, so I um I can't remember now where I was reading this. Um, I want to think it was in the theological workbook of the Old Testament, which is a Hebrew lexicon, a, okay. a dictionary of um, Hebrew words, but it doesn't just tell you like, well, it means this. It gives you like the history of the word and its various places it can be found and mm-hmm. tries to help you see the, the multi-po- multivalent, that's right, multivalent uh, reality of Hebrew. Um, so... Multivalent. So, like, you look at a word and it gives you various, it, various meanings, but then context uh-huh, in that era uh-huh. and, and history that of space it, of the world, yeah, and connection to other languages like Akkadian, which Hebrew is very intimately tied to, and Arabic, the the roots are tied to each other. Okay, um, you know, they got off the same boat. Right. Okay. Mm-hmm. So, um, uh, anyway, I think this is where I was finding this, but I it. But I can't remember because hmm. I know we just did for the um, the Hebrew Collegium lectionary. We did go through Genesis, and then we ended up in the the blessings that were given by hmm. Jacob to his sons. I don't think that's where this was. Anyway, I'm pretty sure it was the, the theological dictionary. Um, God, maybe it was in <laughs> no, maybe fun. it was in Grothius. We are like on the edge I know, of our seats. We're I know. Like, we don't care where no, you figured I know. it maybe, out. Maybe it was in Grothi's, uh, uh Justification of the Ungodly, which is a Romans oh. commentary that has a very speckled and controversial LCMS pedigree. Anyway, um, it was talking about the ancient world's view of blessing. And maybe it was Gospel <laughs> of the Stars. Um, I'm reading a few books. Can you tell? Um, the... Uh, uh, and Gospel in the Stars is by Seiss, S-E-I-S-S, and fascinating read. Um, it was talking about how the ancient world, not just Christians, but Christians is evidently in the Hebrew mindset. Yeah. Um, fathers believed they could, should, must bless their offspring. Mm-hmm. And that this was like divine. So you said, you know, I don't know if you divinely blah, blah, blah. That If it's divine that inspiration. The, when the father mm-hmm. speaks to the son and says, I bless you, I, 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 it's, it's more than a prayer. Hmm. Um, it's not prophecy, but it's more than a prayer. So, you know, on that spectrum, but you know, prophecy, guaranteed future, uh, prayer, asking Jesus for it, blessings like somewhere in the middle hmm. and that they all had this awareness that the father's words to the son as blessing were certainly better than cursing. Cursing didn't go well. Cursing would drive that son off into horrible places. Um, and so, uh, you know, the big place where this happens in the Bible is before somebody dies. So, you know, Father, bless me before you die kind of thing. Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, give me your good word to let me know you are pleased with me, you are proud of me, and you foresee good for me. And that this is more, again, than just a prayer. It is it is something that really is true when it's said. It's a deep truth. I'm pretty convinced that that, that is not like a religious uh, superstitious reality that that is natural law that that the relationship of father and son is founded upon words from father to son and that the father does glorify the son the father bless and is all reflecting Jesus and, and the father um, and that in this way uh, the naming of the son is the first time that happens hmm. right um, and this applies to daughters too but the, the naming of the child the father's naming of the child um, is incredibly important in directing that child's life um and it's not magic it's not you know, it's not prophecy uh but it it means something and that child will forever have that meaning mean something even if it doesn't mean anything then that not meaning anything will be imperative to that child's self-understanding and lack of meaning in life you know um, who are you named after you know well you know the shoe company <laughs> You know, like right. you're you're not going to be like proud of that. Probably you well, might not hate it, but you're going to be yeah. kind of, you know. And so we were. Um, and, and so I was just reading this recently, like was like, oh, yeah, I believe this because I've always thought you know, evidently in the Bible names mean things. Mm-hmm. Um, they're not always translated that way. I'd love to see a translation of the Bible someday where they have the meanings of the names rather than just the weirdo sounds that are like, you know, you know, they <laughs> try to think of one. Pika. Huzz and buzz. Yeah, right, right. Muhammad <laughs> Hashbahaz. Um, yeah. So, like, like the name, the meaning is so much more valuable. 
Um, and we just have lost that. And mm -hmm. so we, we did intentionally do that. And it has impacted them because we tell them what their name means and why. And they're like, oh, it's me, you know? Yeah. You know, I got this amazing name, Jonathan, because it's not the name of my mother's ex-boyfriend. Like, like that, that didn't help, right? Gosh. That one didn't help. Um, I love the name Jonathan. I love who he is. So, it, well, you know, I've been able to it, go and dig for it, but I was never yeah. told that. I was never told how great the guy is. Yeah, that's sad. So, like. Because yeah. he is. He's really great. And um, it's one of those things where God works through our sin. <laughs> so, it's like, yeah, you're not named after her ex-boyfriend, but um, God used that and gave you this amazing did. gift of a name. He did. First Samuel fourteen twelve, you want a riddle? First Samuel fourteen twelve, run that through Leviticus twenty six eight. Just opens the story up so much. It's really cool, and I'm not even gonna tell you. You have to come back. You ask a question next time. We're gonna just so, keep going because we got to, plenty of questions, and go back to and then go to what you brought a book to talk about. Oh, I didn't. We'll, oh. I didn't bring anything. <laughs> I saw a book there once upon a time. It was. I was gonna read it before the show oh. started because I'm just. <laughs> I, yeah, I gotcha. was trying to take every opportunity to use my time. <clears throat> but to, to go back to the concept of teaching your tiny children, um, just do it. Just speak out loud what you are reading. So anything, essentially anything that you are reading, you could read out loud to them and they're going to hear it even if you're not um, sitting down and saying, okay, little son, it's time to learn this now. You know, they're soaking it up like a sponge. So just read your Bible out loud. Read the hymns. Sing what the hymns. you do is what they will do. Mm -hmm. You can tell them to do all you want. If you don't do it, they're not they're not going to do it. Yeah. Um, no. And the, the stuff that they're going to hear and see in church is probably the best place to start because then it's reinforced each week on Sunday in a more grand way way mm -hmm. and they will feel more at home at church because they're like oh f my father prays the lord's prayer with me every day mm -hmm. or i hear him saying the lord's prayer while he washes the dishes or folds the laundry or again, or, that, that hymnal you know, that used in of. any way mm -hmm. and then found at church is going to be like a, 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 a magnet basically yeah it just combines the two worlds it mm -hmm. makes them one mm -hmm. and so yeah, and so, I mean, again, hymnal, you know, open it up after dinner. You don't have to sing it. Just read one. Absolutely. Just read one. They're so read it beautiful. out loud. Um, all right. So shift gears and do some Absolutely. white nose watch here to get Lead this out on. of the way. Um, so it, the, the thing that has been, um, I think, most, I don't know, if it's interesting, disconcerting, foretelling, um, underground, you're not going to see this in most mainstream media, is the continuation of the farmer protests going on in Europe. Uh, due to various climate agendas, uh, not ESG per se, but like ESG, if you're familiar with that, definitely coming out of the WEF's directives uh, of global world leaders and things like that, uh, the UN's approach to governance, which is a fascinating thing the more you learn about how they aren't quite a government, but they have power over the government. It's really interesting. Uh, you're finding a lot of native-born European nationalities hmm. okay because many of these countries are no longer just the spanish aren't just spanish anymore they have a whole bunch of people from other places as well right um but those who are are native to say france and spain and um uh denmark uh and definitely italy is what we're looking at on the screen right now um they are protesting pushing back against policies enacted by the government that are going to put them out of Good for them. Business, mm -hmm. right? Uh, to 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 impoverish them, to make them into serfs again. Because yeah. remember, like the whole serf word comes from Europe, <laughs> like like their history, and they're headed back that direction. And this is, of course, what a lot of people are concerned about: current global monetary policy doing. Uh, whether or not you believe in uh, central bank digital currencies as a good or bad thing, I think it's inevitable that they are a control vector for keeping the common man in the uh, what um, in the box that the bankers want you to be in. So so what you see here then is in uh, Rome you have a, um, a cabbie revolt taking mm -hmm. place, protests taking place, uh, waving flags uh, against uh, certain governmental actions that are making Uber have more power than you know the local groups that have been there for many years. Um, 
Uh, there's another one here. You can see uh, Italians celebrating the Prime Minister Mario Draghi resigning. This, uh, along with these protests that are taking place, um, you also have uh, a number of Prime Ministers resigning over the past week, and it's it's a little weird. It's almost like, wait, how can they all be happening right now? Like you think it's good, but are you sure it's good? So mm-hmm. Boris Johnson's the most famous one. He's the Prime Minister of England, um, and uh, you know if you go with the the so-called conspiracy theory end of things, the idea is that what they're doing is those who are really in power are having their useful idiots who run the country for them take the fall, and they're just going to bring in someone else who's going to do the same bidding. So. Um, in fact, a guy named Rishi is one of the, the main names coming out for uh, for replacing Boris Johnson from the quote unquote conservative party of, of Britain. And uh, and he's one of the biggest advocates of a central bank digital currency. These are these digital monies that then are tied to your name. And so you can only use them when they allow you to and they can turn it off a lot easier than like the dollar. Like if I have a dollar and I give it to you, no one in Washington, D.C. can be like, you can't do that. Like they can't stop it. Central bank digital currency. I I try to send you my dollar, and it says um, he has already bought meat this week, mm-hmm. and then I can't do it. Right. So so uh, you know, is it good? Is it bad? Uh, there's all sorts of uh, attempts to do all sorts of things right now, and uh, just knowing that it's going on, uh, let your prayers rise up for those who are the common man, the poor. That's the Bible is very clear. It cares about the poor, and by that it means the average human being who is often being oppressed by by the rich. And so, well, again, here here's where we see that taking place. And and uh, speaking of that, uh, so Sri Lanka collapsed, like it didn't fall into the ocean, but the government collapsed. And this was, I think, just before the show last week, but. Um, the uh, uh, their prime minister escaped on a boat. Um, his the presidential palace was invaded by um, you know middle aged men who were taking selfies of themselves in his pool and lying on his bed and a bunch of other stuff. And then they burned it to the ground or, or burned it. It was on fire and in flames. Um, these are people who were starving. People whose families are starving. Mm-hmm. Uh, people the, the entire place is they're in a famine. Uh, they have no energy. The the, the government collapsed the system collapsed um again uh, a poster child for environmental remediation in the last five years via globalist goals and what it led to was great poverty um now uh the um uh, the sri lankan prime minister is telling the this is, comes courtesy of the bbc um is telling the remaining military there to use whatever um let me let me just quote this here um uh, oh, where is it? Yeah, there it is. Sri Lanka PM tells military to do whatever necessary to restore order. So here you have like impoverished people who are starving, who are protesting and rioting, and the wealthy people who have put them in the situation tell the military, do whatever it takes to shut them down. Right? Not surely not feed them. Not fix it. Right? Not fix it. And they do need to restore order. There's no question they need to restore order. But then on top of this, so these these um, poor people who are revolting, they're fascists. So, quote, we can't allow fascists to take over. We must end this fascist threat to democracy. That's the language of the government that just collapsed, telling the military okay. to put down the poor people because they're all fascists, right? Is- what this is, is whenever you're up, uh, whenever you would say anything against the global elite, Mm-hmm. They're going to call you a fascist because they know that that word triggers you to go, oh, am I? And it triggers their their power base to be like, well, we got to stop that because Nazis are bad. Okay, so I need two questions answered. So what is the fascist ideology? That's Because I think communism. Right, mm-hmm. right. Well, communism is what's actually taking place. The ones who are trying to put down the fascists often are communists, right. and fascists and communists hated each other. So, right. communism, Russia, fascism, okay. Nazi, Germany. Okay, so, and they fought each other. They both are totalitarian. They both involve a government that has all power over everything. Okay. But they have different philosophies behind them. Um, ultimately, I don't see them acting so different than bad kinks. They're bad kinks. Okay. But they are, um, they have a different view of, of human. The human, uh, human nature, I think a little bit. Because they're the ones with the sticks all pointing. Yeah, in the so fasci comes from Italian uh, fascism, which preceded uh, Nazi Germany in terms of being called fascism. It usually, and and some can make the argument that Nazi Germany wasn't fascism. In fact, it's called National Socialism. Um, but they were allied together as the Axis powers and, and all this. 
but the word fashi is a bundle of sticks. And so the idea is that um, in order for your bundle not to break, they all must lie in the same way, right? You can, I can break one stick. You've heard this talk yeah. about marriage and stuff, right? I can break yeah. one stick, but I put them all together. Oh, we're stronger together. And so you need to, as a leader, have the power to force the people into line in the same way, fascism. Uh, communism is more about the concept that we must have all shared goods, right? Okay. And so we need all the goods in order to equally disperse all the goods to everyone in the commune. So then we will have equality that way. So they, they, they really are coming at totalitarianism from different places. They both end up in totalitarianism, which is, which is why, again, for, for anybody to just call these poor people fascists, right? Well, I mean, and I'm, maybe there are some fascists. I don't the, know. But like like they're starving people that are, are trying to let their government know they're starving, right? Or stop what's going yeah. on. They're, they've been driven into an animal state. Fasc- they're not organized. Right. I mean, <laughs> well, I mean, essentially, if no, it doesn't look like it. If the government that has fallen, which is my other question, <laughs> is telling them, the military, to do whatever it takes to get them organized again. Um, so that's my other question. Like, if the government has fallen, how do they have any power to tell the military so, or how is there a military? Because there's still, well, whenever a government falls, the military is probably still working somewhere. Like, like the money is going to stop working on some level. But if you've got guns, you've got guns and okay, you can take so what, what you need. Okay, so what does a fallen government mean then? Uh, your, your currency collapses. So like nobody can buy what they need to buy. Trade has stopped happening. So then food supplies are not moving. There's a good chance that somewhere in, or a lot of places, water and electricity just stops functioning on some level. Because again, once the money stops flowing everything cl- shuts down but if i still have a gun i can still do what i want right wow. it really okay. falls into a, a world of violence again there, there there are riots there are people um uh, uh looting or you know burning down palaces going and just doing mm-hmm. whatever they want because it's it's an unleashing of rage a little bit that is taking place and it's is it orchestrated you know i don't know um but uh whenever you would have so so if the presidency of the united states suddenly um, had something really bad happen to it and it stopped being able to to speak at all, mm-hmm. right? Um, and let's say that the same thing happened. Let's think 9-11, okay? Let's say 9-11 did what it really wanted to do and it hit Congress, right? And it hit the president, the White House, and they're all dead. Like, who's going to step in? Well, the military is going to step in. Are they going to give power back? In, in America, you'd like to think they would, but, you know, these days, I don't know. You know mm-hmm. I don't know. Um there are going to be, if, if it's not the whole military, like the whole Pentagon, right? You're going to have a general over here and a general over here and a general over here. And they're going to have a, a chain of command that's built to act in emergencies and crisis situations. And they have weapons, they have supplies, they have stockpiles. So they're going to be your de facto government in the event that the, the um, uh, it's not layman, what's the word? Civilian government uh, no longer works, right? Okay. And this is where a, a coup in theory, is a time when the military government decides that it, it just doesn't like the civilian government and so it's just going to take over. And that, that does happen, has happened in history often mm-hmm. enough, right? And so, I mean, in, in theory, the, uh, the culture of the American military would look upon any kind of coup as a traitor, being a traitor to the identity of, of the country. And so we have okay. this really strong belief in, in the Constitution. But we've been working hard to destroy that concept. So again, who knows at what point when they decide, you know, we have the guns, do what we say. Um, and whether or not they can, I mean, that's another question, uh, lowering standards and, and all this kind of stuff. But so point being, you know, yeah, there is still military. Is the military perfectly? Or, no, it's Sri Lanka. Their military is cannot possibly be what we think of when we think of the American military. They're, mm. they're not. But they're people with bigger guns. They have guns. They have armor. They have tanks. Right. And so with these people in like no shoes and like sweatpants running away. Right. Um, so. So what is what is Sri Lanka um, like? How do they fit in the grand scheme of things like for us? Do we do we trade with them? Do we have any sort of they're, relationship they're with a, them? They're in the if you think of the world as like spheres of influence, mm-hmm. they're in the sphere of influence of India. Mm hmm. Um, not China, right? And okay. uh, culturally, they're they're there. So um, historically, a poor nation. Uh, I believe they cannot provide their own food. So they probably are in a caste system. I don't know. I don't know. If uh, there there is a caste India. system that is there, okay. right? As a nation, they cannot provide their own food. There's not enough farmland for the people who live there. Something like that. And so they rely on India for their food. India is currently. 
um, in its own famine. I mean, the whole world's going into a food crisis. India does, though, provide its own food and export food. So what India has done is stopped exporting food. That's what's going to cause the crisis elsewhere, but they're keeping it for their own people, which governments in theory exist to protect their own people. I know in the U.S. that's not true, but everywhere else, that's true. <laughs> it used to be true. Mm. We thought it was true. Um, so so as a result of, of that, largely, I mean, it's a big piece of this. How does this impact the U.S.? It, it, it doesn't, other than it's like, if you're watching the global collapse of the economic system, Mm-hmm. A, a domino just fell, right? It's a little domino. Is it going to knock anything else over? Maybe not. Or it's kind of like when you're watching the, you know, you're going to boil your water and you're kind of watching all those bubbles at the bottom of the pot mm-hmm. and you're waiting for, oh, there went one. Okay, so <laughs> how long till the next one pops up, right? Sure. That That's kind of what this is. Um, I mean, these these people need our prayers. Absolutely. Dear Jesus, have mercy on the poor. Um, uh, throw down tyrants, cast them down. Psalm 109. It's been um, big in my plate this last week. Uh, be careful if you go there. It's going to ask your enemies to be destroyed. But like we sh- we sh- look, what's going on? You know, golly, how can we not pray these things? Um, so I keep going. Of course. Um, speaking of uh, uh, these kinds of same kind of things um, in France, uh, Macron, who is a, a WEF crony for sure. Um, he is uh, the prime minister of France and was pushing a COVID passport and is still trying to push through a uh, vaccine passports. Like so yesterday. Um, it's, it's so <laughs> next week. But um, anyway, his passport has been defeated um, by a coalition of the far left and the far right, which is so you, that what's panning right now. You see their actual um, uh, parliament and the people on the right are cheering and the people on the left are cheering and in the middle no one's cheering <laughs> um so uh some have called macron a lame duck uh prime minister he did uh survive a challenge to his government the way that prime ministers and and coalition governments work in european parliaments are a little different than ours he survived a challenge this last year but that doesn't mean he's strong and this looks to be like it's uh maybe working against him and given the resignations that have been taking place in other countries that are kind of like doing the same thing uh, something to keep an eye of eye on there uh, anyway but the the shutting down of regulation papers please government uh, via passports that are based upon your willingness to submit to um, Nuremberg code breaking medical comp, com, medically compelled treatments um, I'd, I'd call that a win uh, even though I, I don't give medical advice on this show there's no. no medical advice. I'm a big fan of the Nuremberg Codes, though. You might remember these. They were developed after the Nazi regime was found to be doing all sorts of medical experimentation on people who didn't sign up for it. Mm. And so they're they're like international law for uh, whether or not you can be prosecuted for war crimes, right? Um, this is also where uh, you, you get the idea. So so the Nazi, you know, captain would say something like, "Well, I was just following orders." So the Nuremberg Codes uh, have a. a, a a section in them that state that um, you cannot say I was just following orders and not be charged if the order was mass murder these people, mm. right? It, you are obligated by moral virtue to resist and uh, disobey immoral orders. So right? then, does that apply to the Nurem, uh, to the Sri Lanka military? They don't. They don't. Well, who's going to bring them to, to court? That. Who's going to bring them to court? No. Th- the point is that no one is really paying attention to these anymore. These were like globally agreed upon standards post World War II to stop this kind of thing from ever happening again. Um, and if you look at what's happened um, in the last couple of years uh, with regard to um, the scuttling of information mm-hmm. about your own life s- s- length based upon <laughs> things okay let the reader understand um uh Nuremberg codes have been have been broken um this is one of the big uh uh how do i describe these people the conspiracy theorists that are out there um uh stating that evil things have been done in certain communities without mm-hmm. our knowledge and that lots of money has been made um one of their big beefs is that uh, you know if you're going to be fired because you won't take your medicine yeah. That is a breach of Nuremberg. Sure. It, it is war crimes. It is international war crime level stuff. And so to, to recognize that um, uh, is a big deal. Now, you mentioned this is so last week. I mean, you know, okay, so breaking. Los Angeles County has high COVID activity levels starting uh, a two-week countdown to the return of indoor mask mandates. That was July 14th. And we can see uh, uh, 
uh, Mr. Fauci uh, on CNN uh, talking about uh, that we really should wear masks and congregate uh, in congregate and indoor settings, that this is uh, now and moving forward. So um, don't be surprised. My point here is not to besmirch Fauci. I, you know, you can do that. I'm I don't give medical advice on this show. I'm just waiting for another strike. But um, my point here is, yeah, don't be surprised. Don't be surprised. Like, it's coming back. Okay? Just get ready. It's coming back. They're going to push it. Where will your... I mean, Florida's not going to listen. Right? Where will your county be? Where will your area be? I don't know. Just don't think it's over. That's all I'm saying. Don't think it's over. Um, speaking of Fauci... Uh, they are looking for homes for the 4,000 beagles that are no longer going to be used in medical experiments by this uh, massive oh CDC. Goodness, so it's ridiculous. And when you see pictures of what they did to the beagles and the kind of experience they were doing, it was, it was awful. And this is something, again, that uh, Fauci decided he, he would stop um, he, being prosecuted for it. No. Where's PETA when you need him? I mean, really. Um, so apparently, though, if you, if you want a beagle, um, they're in need of homes. It's a Virginia facility. What do they come to you like? I mean, are they going to be missing body? No, I I think I think these beagles. I mean, the pictures they look fine. These are the beagles that were you know being housed for experimentation, not the post. Oh, you know the ones that are post. They actually walk upright and will serve you tea. I'm just kidding. (laughs) (laughs) It was, um, and I don't even remember what it was. This story came out uh, almost a year ago, and you know it 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 amounted to torture, torture of these animals. Um, And so, uh, so funny story though. We got this spray. It's called <clears throat> Mucky Puppy Spray. Because <laughs> you can't evidently bathe your dog very often because it's bad for their skin. And their the pH balance of their skin mm-hmm. gets thrown off. So I got this spray for the dog. And um, it's fine. It's fine. But on the bottle, it says... Um, <laughs> not tested on animals? <laughs> not tested on animals. Like, wait, wait a minute. What? What? what, what? So it's for my dog, but you've not <laughs> ever put it on a dog Use before. A dog. But we're worried about pH on the dog skin. Wait a minute, shouldn't you t- test the stuff for the dogs on dogs because you're wanting to help the dogs? I mean, isn't that I, I, yeah? So I mean, I, I don't want to say <laughs> I don't want to say all testing is bad. No, but this is not that. This is this is experiment. Um, I and mean, you can go Google the story. Uh, Google. Yeah. You can go brave search the story. Um, and, and find out more. Uh, you will be you'll be kind of horrified when you when you look at it. Um, so, uh, post millennials uh, Libby, is it Libby Emmons was on Timcast. If you're familiar with uh, uh, Tim, I forget his last name now. Um, anyway, pretty pretty big podcast, definitely bigger than we are. Uh, he was kind of a liberal. He's not anymore because you know once you get on the wrong side of the eye of Sauron, you tend to wake up sometimes. Anyway, uh, he, he had a nice conversation about. Uh, breaking people out of cults is quote sort of what we're trying to do and that after getting her mom to stop watching Rachel Maddow and CNN her mom now says I'm proud of you to her Um, so uh, having a conversation about the mass formation psychosis and how if you're only listening to certain things particularly if it's on your TV and you're not doing research with reading that you are you know if you haven't seen links to actual scientific papers on the thing that you're being told about, then maybe they're lying, right? Um, And maybe you're in a cult. If you're doing things to your body that are not proven to actually do anything, um, say, um, if you're gonna wear a tinfoil hat to protect you from, uh, from radio waves, right? Maybe you're in a cult. And let the reader understand, sometimes you wear the tinfoil hat on your face. Sometimes you don't, right? Um, it, maybe you're in a cult. So to see these non-Christians, these are these are not Christian people that are. I mean, maybe maybe Libby Emmons is, but the the conversation is not one about coming to the faith. Okay, mm-hmm. um, to see them talking about how we're facing a cult, like when are the Christians going to realize this? Yeah, that, that's my yes, question. Please, right? Um, which I will this bring me to Jordan Peterson? No, not yet. Oh, just speaking to the cult. Oh my goodness. So Elizabeth Warren, Senator Extraordinaire, non Native American Indian who took advantage of claiming she was one to make her privileged life what it is. Is that um, her? That's her. She's a scary In all woman. Her glory. She's a scary woman. Uh, mm. She she weighs about as much as a duck, as, as I quoted, and I got a lot of uh, engagement because I referenced Monty Python when I did that, which is sad because the real issue here. What does that mean? Um, I'll tell you in a minute. The okay. real issue here is that she says, "quote Crisis pregnancy centers that are there to f- are uh, that are there to fool people looking for pregnancy termination help outnumber abortion clinics 
clinics by three to one. We need to shut them down all around the country. So what she's saying here with aggressiveness is that if you're wanting to help a woman keep her baby, baby, we need to stop you because she should be, you're, you're going to fool her into keeping her baby. Okay. This is how wicked, so this is how wicked the cult is. And you can see the, the, the zeal in her cult like eyes as she does, as she says this now, um, wicked, um, the wicked something of the West. Okay, so this is getting back to the duck. She weighs about as much as a duck. There's an entire scene in Monty Python and the Holy Grail mm-hmm. where someone is accused of being a witch and she says, I'm not a witch. Oh. And they're like, look at her nose. And it's like a fake nose they put on her. They're like, they put this on me. Some guy says she turned me into a newt and everyone looks at him because he's a man. And he's like, I got better. And then the the, the wise uh, knight of the round table says, well, I, I know science. And, and so, uh, the, and it's a long drawn out <laughs> thing, but they figure out that... Um, uh, because a duck floats and, and, uh, because a duck floats, how's it go? And it's made of wood and witches are made of wood. Then if she weighs as much as a duck, then she's a witch. So they get out this giant scale and they have her sit opposite a duck and it in fact balances. So she's a witch. And so they you go off got to kill in her. trouble for that? No, 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 no. I just, I had more engagement. Um, on the reference, because all the responses are like these other quotes, quotes out of Monty Python, right? So, um, but the the point I was just trying to say, like, like look, look, this is what um, a wicked person is, uh, and uh, you know, God, God save her soul from herself. But yeah, the compassion level is just gone. It's so nil. It's like it. Uh, <laughs> and so, and, and, if a girl <clears throat> is in a scenario where she has no support. Then therefore, she just has to kill that baby. Have you ever heard the argument That's from these? Sad. From these, these are usually like uh, pro-abortion Christians, mm-hmm. right? They want to be Christian and and abortion, uh, pro-abortion. They always are like, well, if you Christians really, really cared, you'd do something for the women and the children. You wouldn't just say outlaw abortion. You ever hear that argument? I've heard it multiple I mean, times. I'm, I'm yeah. Sure. I've heard it multiple times. They always they want to claim that somehow Christians just want to like make abortion illegal, but then leave the women in their struggles. The, the pregnancy centers that help the women outnumber the abortion clinics three to one. So don't don't tell us we're not trying to do good. You're trying to shut down the very good that you're going to go and accuse us of not doing. They are such liars. They are such yeah. liars. And this is where, again, as a Christian community, you need to start stopping the white noise. You need to start shutting it down. You not need to know that when when they accuse you of something, it's a good hint that that's actually what they're doing. Mm-hmm. That's how they play this game. And they have no conscience. Their conscience is seared. Stop believing people who worship demons, whether on purpose or not. Stop believing that people who don't believe in Jesus, that don't believe in the truth of the Bible, that even don't believe in the freedom of Western civilization, stop thinking they tell the truth. They don't believe in truth. They believe in power and finances. Gosh, Nancy Pelosi's drunk husband just bought a bunch of stocks the day before a vote in, in, uh, in Congress over those very kinds of stocks. I mean, it's, it's, they're just cheats. Ah. So bumper sticker, it said, pro-women, pro-child, pro-choice. And my child Liar. in the car was like, how does Liar. that all go together? Liar. It doesn't. Liar. It's a lie. And they have no problem lying. Their consciences are seared. We were warned. That's a Bible quote. They, we were warned about this. Mm-hmm. In the last days, men will be lovers of self. So that's the cult. Um, again, back on the idea of non-Christians being more awake than Christians are with regards to the thrust of Christianity. Jordan Peterson put out a, a marvelous little three-minute minute video called A Message to the Christian Churches. You can view it on YouTube. And... Uh, he basically says like, where are you? Mm. Like, can you, where, what, like, can you do what you're supposed to do rather than all this other stuff that isn't what you've historically done? Because what we need, this is not, this is non-believers saying what we need as a society is more Christianity. Amen. And he yes. doesn't even, he doesn't want to Amen. believe it, but he's like, we need it. Without it, we fall apart. Now he wrote one, he did one for Muslims too, but, um, oh yeah, I didn't watch that one. But the thing is I could, I really couldn't disagree with anything he said. Mm-hmm. The only thing was when he's like, he said, will you take care of souls? He should have said for Christ's sake. And it wouldn't have been a curse. And it would have been exactly right. Um, but he, he likes to yell, will you take care of souls? Like he's yelling at the church. You know, mm. will, will you do your job? Um, teach men to be men. Uh, wow. Yeah, I know it's, it's really, really valuable. So again, trying to break people out of the cult. The point is, you know, even non-Christians can see that it's a cult and that we need to like 
fight back intellectually uh, against this cult, spiritually against this cult. Um, oh, we will come back to uh, Ryan Turnipseed and uh, and and uh, what's his name? Askeladad of the LCMS. We will come back to them uh, in a few moments with a question from a viewer about a little Twitter storm that took place oh. um, regarding the so-called, it's not so-called, the National Youth Gathering of the LCMS. We are going to talk about it. Um, I will I will probably pull my punches because I've done this. Oh my I've done this, but let's wait till that question shows up and we'll, we'll get there. I was hoping it just would not. I remember there was, so... Okay, never mind. We'll just wait. Let's move on. Lead on, fearless one. Yeah, yeah. Well, so <laughs> you just ready to go to questions? Yeah, I, yeah. I'm ready. Yeah, it's I'm 10 o'clock, so it's we can time. do that. Um, I can't seem to get these things. Let's see here. I need to move some things so I can reach this thing that allows me to put questions up <laughs> and cover your face. There we you go. You're covered. Jeff okay. says, Pastor Fisk. The LCMS National Youth Gathering is taking place this week. So it's, it's over now, I believe. Um, there was a Twitter thread highlighting some interesting breakout sessions being held. I'm interested to hear your comments on these breakout sessions and the National Youth Gathering in general. Do you recommend other fellowship gatherings for Lutheran youth to attend, like higher things? What options are there when the number of youth attending confessional churches is dwindling or even non-existent in some cases, says Jeff. And we have another question, same topic. <laughs> Trevor says, uh, do you have an opinion on the National Youth Gathering? I have been following it a bit over the past few days, and it looks to me to be very similar to that kind of feel-good camp and conference I went to when I was in a non-denom church, and I personally don't feel that it's the way the LCMS should go. Mm -hmm. uh, I would appreciate your opinion on this. Thanks, and God bless you, Trevor. Okay, so we'll get back to the Twitter um, storm that took place uh, in a moment. But first, okay, if you're on YouTube, go ahead and pause this video and go to my channel, right? And then look up Youth Gathering on my channel. There should be two videos that I did 10 years ago, probably 10 years ago, um, in which I, I look at video footage released from the National Youth Gathering in its promotions about itself after it happened, and I ask some questions. Yeah. So um, if you want my opinion, it's there. Okay. It's, it's really, really there. I'm not really in the mood or the place in life to get into a, an insular debate with weak need, I don't know, glory seeking, I don't know, um, distracted LCMS pastors about how important their youth ministry is. The, the coming food crisis just seems to mean more to me than whether or not you want to go and, and do dance dance praise at 11 o'clock at night at the National Youth Gathering. Um, Is this a real thing? Yeah. Dance, that, that's the old videos. Dance dance praise. Hmm. Yeah. Oh, I, I mean, that, there was like a, <laughs> there's a video game and you could play that. And then there was like a, a late night worship that was effectively a slow dance, you know? Um, so uh, it's just, Embarrassing. It's just it, it embarrassing. is embarrassing. That's what you know, it is. I just take the LCMS off of it. You can there. <laughs> there are people who go, who are good people. There are people who go who say true things. There are moments in which true things that are biblical take place at this event. Um, is it going to keep Lutheran youth in Lutheran churches? You have 40 plus years of scientific evidence that it does not, that they, they do not stay. It, it, this is across the board. There's no question. It doesn't work. But we had a good time. I know. And where are you 10 years later? It's really, really clear cut. But this isn't even about um, are you, an, are you uh, a Lutheran 10 years later? Lutherans aren't the only ones losing people. 
It's true that the big box church sets up a version of the youth gathering for their regular worship service. And so the kids that got excited about living like that are going to leave their small church with its small community and go join the big um, meat market that's at the big box church. And so the big box church is going to take the 150 of the several thousand youth that grew up in the area and put them in one spot so that you don't get to see the decline that's taking place. And it looks like they're being really successful, but all they're doing is taking the, the remnant and shoving them into one spot to continue feeding them lukewarm potential poison. Anything. Yeah. Potential poison. And uh, so to me, it's, it, it's a practical question at the end of the day. And this goes, but I asked the same question. So before you get on me, I asked the same question about our confirmation practice. I had the same question about Sunday school practice, right? Uh, the entire approach to, well, let's, how do we raise up youth in the way they should go? I know. Let's not have the fathers do it in lots of different ways and see how that works out. And then, oh, look, it doesn't work out, but we're going to do it no matter what. And we're going to tell you you're hateful if you tell us you're, we're wrong, because in fact, we're worshiping Baal, but we won't admit it. Now, again, I'm not saying the LCMS Youth Gathering is worshiping Baal directly. I'm making a metaphor that idolatry runs the show of these conversations. Mm -hmm. And so rather than having a conversation about what the impact of these actual things are with some objective facts and like a little research as to how it went the last 40 years, we're going to get into this kind of he said, she said shooting battle where we emote at each other until we all just won't talk to each other anymore. And, you know, and we've just done that already. I'm, I, LCMS, we did that. We already did that. We, we've done it for so long. It's not helping. So if you want to go to the National Youth Gathering, great. Go to the National Youth Gathering. Let your children be taught about pluralism. Let your children be taught about critical race theory. Let your children be taught that what you do in your church isn't the way to do church and the Baptists are right. And then hope the fact that there's one or two preachers that do an actual divine service somewhere in the week, that, that that's good enough. Go ahead. I'm not mad at you. I just think you're wasting your time and maybe sowing the seeds of your own destruction. That's not personal. Um, I'm not going to do it. That That's where I'm at. Like, if you want me to go, I'm going to say no. As for me and my house, well, we're going to go to higher things. Uh, and uh, <laughs> this is the first year we're going to go to higher things uh, in several years. I am not thrilled with the organization the way I once was. I'm not against the organization either. So um, I see this year as a trial. A trial. A trial. The reason I have uh, in the past been a supporter of higher things comes down to to one word. Hymns. H Y M N S hymns. And and I can describe it in a fairly brief story about how it happens every time there's a divine service that opens the week. You go to church like four times a day and it's a real church. Um, divine service opens the week and closes the week. Divine service opening the week, hymn singing, uh, 60%. It's fine. Yeah, everyone's there. End of the week, those kids are singing those mm. songs. Oh my goodness. There's something in the trust that the historical poetry and music of the international tradition that we have in our hymnal, that it, that it, is enculturating. Now, of course, if you go and do that and you go back to your church and then you just kind of smash him singing at your church with loud, slow organ, you know, the kids might have the same problem where they had a big high and now they're on a big low. And so if you're not prepared to help them see that this is kind of a unique event, it's kind of the best of the best. And now we're going to go back and we're going to trust in the words and we're going to attend to the scriptures and the sermon and all this. Like, <clears throat> so it's, it's not sufficient by itself. What is valuable, again, is that you can see some actual Lutheran culture at Higher Things. Um, that does not mean that I believe youth work is the way to go. I certainly don't believe that, any, that taking youth away from their parents is the way to teach them. I am absolutely convicted that if you want your children to be Christians, you need to talk to them about Christianity. And if you abandon that, then you got, you got no excuse, none. Right. Um, these other things aren't going to save them from your negligence to care enough about your faith to speak. Uh, the, the idea that we would fight over the National Youth Gathering right now is just like the boat sailed. The boat sailed. The boat sailed. If you don't see that, if you don't, I mean, the, the institutions that we have. So I'm not talking about people, please. I'm not accusing anybody. 
the International Center, the Synodical Convention, the university systems, the seminary system, these financially will not survive as existent another 20 years. They will not make it. The baby boomer population who still has money because of the way the money game has worked, but who have not and are not passing that money forward to the next generation, but are spending it, they will die. And then they will give some of that money in their death to these organizations. And these organizations organizations will do what they've been doing this whole time, which is spend it. And then it will be gone. And then it will be gone. The National Youth Gathering still makes money. So maybe it'll survive the collapse of the LCMS. I don't know. But the point is, again, if we're, we're fighting over table scraps while the world burns. Now, I get it. You, maybe you just converted to the LCMS. You, you, you grew up Baptist. You grew up non denom like the guy says. And you're like, I thought I got away from this. No, you, you, no, you didn't. No, 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 no. You don't get away from foolishness. You don't. Um, and what you found, I hope, is a local congregation with a pastor who teaches you what the Bible says. And like, that's, that's worth its weight in gold. That's in fact what Jesus sent out as the thing that will endure. He didn't send youth gatherings. He didn't send any youth gatherings. Well, what about the day of Pentecost? Shut up. He didn't send youth gatherings. Uh, he didn't send youth, youth events. He didn't send, you know, um, you know, uh, bounce houses and, and, uh, you know, Play-Doh. He, he sent parents sitting at the foot of a pastor learning the scriptures. If you found that, hold on, right? And and don't be surprised when the systems that are really more about post-World War II Americana, like we just need some camps for our kids to go to, right? Um, don't be surprised when they become uh, the tools of uh, the current zeitgeist, the current spirit of the age. And so that that brings us to the, the Twitter thread feed fight. Um, Ryan Turnipseed, uh, former... Uh, uh, guest on the show back in the uh, morning chill days, um, a worthy follow on YouTube. If you like a guy who's vest vested in some real history and uh, thinks outside the box a little bit, uh, he he had quite a quite a week uh, <laughs> uh, with some conversations on his on his Twitter page. I don't I know you can go you can go read the bloodbath and the fight and see all the shots and all this there. But uh, what he did do that I thought was pretty useful. Um, for my own part was, uh, he gave, he created a, a thread where he went through kind of the breakout session descriptions for the, the youth gathering. Okay. And he, he showed pictures of, and then, uh, quoted the ones that he was most concerned about as, as a young man, by the way, I mean, very young man uh, here. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I'm not going to go through it all. You can go find this again. He's at turnip merchant. Um, oh, I just moved everything. Um, at Turnip Merchant uh, on Twitter, and you can go find this. You have to scroll a ways down to get this one. But uh, um, the one that really jumped out to me most that I do want to talk about here uh, is this one. Let me get this picture here. So the use session on religion, religions, religious says, uh, you know, is the, the sales pitch for mm -hmm. the, the thing, you know, you've got your Buddhist neighbor and your Jewish friend, your Muslim teammate and your spiritual but not religious cousin. Maybe you've wondered to yourself, what do they actually believe? What do they do when they go to the temple, synagogue, mosque and meditation center? How do I have a meaningful spiritual conversation with people who claim a different religious identity than me? In this session, we'll explore why there is such a wide range of religious belief and practice what that means for Christians worldwide, and how, here's the key, and how you can navigate the shift from Christian privilege to spiritual plurality in your everyday life. I have no idea what they're trying to imply there. Well, and that's, you that's know, disturbing. maybe... Like what I am assuming they imply is really disturbing. Right, so, so like, the, word, the word privilege... Truly they didn't The word privilege... <laughs> is a word used by racists yes. who want to make people who look like us shut up and go to our place, which is under them. And then to take that and apply it not to people who look like us, but to Christians is either incredibly ignorant, incredibly deceptive. You, either one of those. Now, 
I can imagine. What they really mean is moving from a society where Christianity was supported by the culture to a society where Christianity is not. Like, okay, but see, you didn't know by talking heads that you shouldn't be being led by the nose by. And again, here is the direction we're going, right? Mm -hmm. Now, the other word, though, is the word plurality. Okay, spiritual plurality. So pluralism is the belief that all religions lead to God. And so if we're going to navigate the shift from Christian privilege to spiritual plurality in our everyday lives, are you teaching for us to be aware that there are non-Christians out there, that there are more than us, and that we're going to be sort of spiritually oppressed? Or are you saying we're just one of many and it's all good? Now, I would hope, I would hope that I've got the worst construction on it with that latter one, but that word plurality is awful close to the word pluralism. And you're either, in the best case scenario is you're incredibly ignorant of who we are as a people. Incredibly ignorant of what we're up against. Best case scenario. So um, the fact that there is a group at the event um, called Lutherans for Racial Justice and that many of the people affiliated with that group are involved in the production of the event, okay? Um, that again, so racial justice, this is this is a key word for um, new racism, okay? And, and what they do is they get people who hate themselves, hate their own kind to shame their own kind in order to create divides between us and others who ought to, there ought to be no dividing wall of hostility between us and other races. Like whatever your nationality is, there should be as a Christian, no dividing wall of hostility, right? Um, but, but the concept of racial justice implies that there is a dividing wall of hostility and that the only way out of it is for you to renege on your privilege, which is to give up those things that you have that are good. This is, again, is just a communist ploy to get you to give all the things of the government to redistribute the wealth. And guess what? They're not going to give you all of it back. But anyway, you just don't know that you think this is about loving your neighbor. Why is that the topic and not Galatians 2, right? And so uh, a friend here in the area said last night to me, you know, what he read through all these and he read through the whole thing. He said, it's just so sad that all of the breakouts are like, well, your world sucks. So here's how we can kind of maybe deal with it. Uh, like everything was about the the sad state of youth culture. Mm-hmm. Uh, and um, not to black pill it, but but it wasn't about like, here's the Bible, here's our history, read the Psalms, pray that you know. Maybe they said that behind the scenes, maybe they did. Um, but so so you know, you're asking my opinion about this Twitter fight and and this Twitter thread. I thought the thread was useful. I think it's useful to know what's going on. But at the same time, honestly, I've I've given up the National Youth Gathering for a lost cause a long time ago. It will keep making money. Um, because it's fun. And so things that are fun get people who are Americans to spend their money to do them, especially if they can tell themselves that it was virtuous. But it doesn't mean it was virtuous. And the only way to know or not know is to pay attention to the words that are actually being said and then ask, what is the real proposed reason for this thing? Right. Why are we doing this? Well, it's so that our, our young Lutherans will grow up and stay Lutheran. Okay, again, it's evident from, from decades now that, that that doesn't function that way. So then why are we still doing it? You can apply the same thing to many, 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 many Lutheran schools, which do not serve actual Lutherans in the first place, but claim to be a mission to the community. And you can go and do the research how many families ultimately joined and if only one family joined if only one family joined it's worth bankrupting the church so the church goes away really i mean do you believe in election do you, do you believe in the power of the word of god I, i'm not sure you do and that's that's where that that matters more than than the actual thing right it's like what's under this what's under revivalism what is the the means that bring about the new measures finney's new measures why do we have to trick the people into being christian with excitements oh because you don't actually believe it. it's like relevant really you know and again if you don't believe it's relevant i don't think you've discovered the psalms and the proverbs call me crazy uh oh, i don't know how much i just put my neck out there i, don't, I just don't want to have a fight i know i'm gonna get like blowback i don't it doesn't matter guys like go do your thing you know you want to be the lutheran church that sings Love songs great you're, you're just not going to have lutherans which you don't think that's important okay i mean i i'm i'm pretty sure i'm on record as complaining about 
Lutheran insularity and the use of the word Lutheran meaning like not what it should or not anything at all. And, and maybe it's kind of just every time you say it, you're kind of wasting your breath as well. Cause, cause what are we really about in theory? What we want to have is sola scriptura Christians, sola gratia Christians, sola fides Christians, sola, um, Christe Christians. Uh, and in theory, that's what we want. Right. And so you can, you can shout Lutheran left and right and not have that either. So, If you want to be a Methodist, be a Methodist, you know, and, and I, and I don't, for those of you who are worried about it, like, look, are you trying to save the institutions? You think the LCMS as an organization is going to survive? See, I just, I, you know, when you see the house burning, just, just step outside on the porch, maybe step far enough away that the wall can't collapse and you don't have to leave the property. Don't intend to leave the property, but you're just going to have to rebuild the house. But it's like, you got to let it burn down first. And I, am I saying we should help it burn down? Am I put, no, I don't want to start a fire. I just, no one seems to be throwing water on it. So, you know, and, and it's only doing what the rest of civilization is doing right now. Again, the fact that they're parodying racial justice, this is CRT, right? If you're upset about CRT in schools, yeah, you should be upset about this. Why'd you send your kids to it? Why'd you spend $3,000? <laughs> How wealthy are you? Goodness gracious. Oh, you guys sold hot dogs for a whole year in the narthex to make it work out. God, what did that teach the kids? So. You, you, <laughs> I, it doesn't mean higher things is perfect, uh, nor even good. Uh, although I, I think that they, if you're going to do something, you should do something where they, they want to be what they are. Yeah. Uh, rather than trying to be something they're not. The more we try to be something we're not, the less the world's going to listen to us. They're just going to see us as hypocrites. Which, But, you know, if no one else is talking about racial justice, it's a good way to get famous really fast in your church body. You know, be the first one on it. Um, all that, all that, all that. All right. Well, we can move on. Mm. Charles Frost says this. Oh, this one's sad. Oh, not as sad as the next one. It's still sad. Um, did I cover? Oh, no, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. Before we do this, I got one more. Uh, I mentioned uh, Ask Ladat of the LCMS um, has a, a, a quote, again, that gets at the idea. Um, he says, the more I delve down this rabbit hole, this is NYG stuff again, the more I delve down the rabbit hole, the worse it gets. Let's start at square one. Um, Kent Chitwood, I don't know him from Adam, uh, delivered a sectional at the LCMS National Youth Gathering that promised to show, quote, Oh, he's, it's the same thing. Know how you how you can navigate the shift from Christian privilege to spiritual priority in your everyday life. Um, and then uh, he has a little more. The leader of the sectional, um, a Lutherans for Racial Justice friend. Um, and, yeah, and he so he, he starts to point out how they're being, um, it seems like Lutherans for Racial Justice has a lot of influence on the, the event itself. Um, What does... So, you know, he spoke a with a Lutheran... Sikh man. In an interview he produced for Lutherans for Racial, Racial Justice, he spoke about the ways in which we talk to our children about diversity and inclusion, as well as the way we model showing love to all of humanity and where we can improve. So, again, when you're... I'm not against showing love to all of humanity, but when you're parroting the talking points of the enemies of Western civilization as they attempt to destroy Christianity, because that's what mm -hmm. they're doing. I don't think the West is necessarily worth saving, but the West was built upon Christianity. And so you can't attack the West without attacking Christianity. And that's probably why they're doing it. Um, uh, when you start adopting the language that is intentionally aimed at destroying what we believe you're again sowing the seeds of your own destruction whether by ignorance well, you're just really ignorant you just didn't realize that you were quoting the devil okay you know but what you do do quickly mm. Mm. you wanted to say something else i you basically answered it i wanted to know what their platform was like what okay why are we needing to have this group we of need people. more diversity and inclusion and so the fact that you would say that means you're not really digging in the bible and wanted to teach what the Bible says. Because if you were digging in the Bible and wanted to teach what the Bible says, you would never talk about diversity and inclusion. Those are not words the Bible uses. You're like, well, does that mean you want to keep people out? Like, okay, so you are a fascist, right? <laughs> you, you are a Marxist. You are, in fact, just someone who wants to aggravate and divide. Mm -hmm. um, the Bible has its own way of talking about things that the world makes into idols. 
And we shouldn't take the world's idols and use them to prove the Bible. We should take the Bible and use it to tear down the world's idols. So the Bible doesn't talk about diversity. It talks about breaking down the dividing wall of hostility. The Bible doesn't talk about inclusion. It talks about hospitality. So again, when you, when you choose to use the enemy's language, then the enemy will win. Hmm. It's kind of straightforward and sad. If you sent your kids to it, I'm sorry. Don't do it again. Stop wasting your money. Like the only way they change is to bankrupt them. When they go woke, they need to go broke. And if you aren't going to do it, then they're going to keep doing what they're doing. You know, cancel your Disney Plus, by the way. Do it. Do it. Do it. Uh, Charles Frost says this. I've been having some trouble getting over someone. Hmm. To give more context, I made an incredibly close relationship with her as friends in a year to the point of codependency, he says. Then I fell for her pretty hard and we realized we were too close. So that means she wasn't interested? It's kind of a weird, like, you were too close, but you didn't get together because you're just friends, right? Okay, so I'm, I'm, I'm thinking it's she wasn't inter interested. A year and a half later, I'm still having difficulty moving on from her. She is in my dreams and is on my mind daily, though I try not to think about her. I've been praying about the topic, but is there any advice you can give? I just want to move on. Um, I found Bible verses I wanted to use for the last one, but that's okay. Did you ever have a scenario in your life where you were like that? Too many. Oh. Because of my own emotional neediness, um, every breakup was pretty hard. Like year and a half hard. I squeezed it all into a couple months, but I had a year and a half worth of pain. Mm. Like, like, I don't want to say blurred vision, <laughs> but like, like squeezed. Oh, well, you know how I can be a little over the top. <laughs> I love you for it. Mm, thank you. Um, yeah, I've been in a situation where I could not stop thinking about a girl, and and I rolled around on the bed and moaned and, and cried and yelled and drove around and, you know, and, and then, um, and then how'd you get over it? Time passed, mm -hmm. but see, he's had a year and a half. So mm -hmm. I've not been in that time passed, but I think it's somewhere before time passed. I realized she wasn't coming back. Mm -hmm. Like, so there's, uh, my, my answer here, I got a psalm for you to focus on, but you know, reality is going to beat you. And so the moment that you join its side, you're kind of just better off. What so, does that mean? Well, it means that what he is doing as he pines mm -hmm. is he's living in a fantasy. And he's wanting the fantasy to be real. Yeah. But reality is real. And... uh the fantasy needs to then die. Um, nostalgia needs to die when it's in the way of today. Um, on one level, this is idolatry. So if you want the language of repentance, you can use it. Mm -hmm. I've got a question about repentance coming up. Apparently I'm offending people by telling people to repent of things that aren't sins or something like that. So we'll, I, we'll, we'll, we'll get to that. Um, you can repent of like spilling your coffee. You just clean it up. I mean, that's the meaning of the word. <laughs> just, just turn go, the opposite yeah, direction. Just go the other way. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, but, uh, you know, idolatry is something to actually repent of. Mm -hmm. And so um, codependency, you've confessed already. Well, that's idolatry. Codependency is idolatry. You have made the other person like unto a God to you and are relying on them for things that they cannot possibly provide to you. Um, and so uh, repentance, meaning like, Jesus, I'm sorry for over believing in the value of this thing you haven't given me. Oh, just cut my own heart out about the Jeep right there. <laughs> um, I'm sorry, right, for over believing in the value of this thing you have not given me. Um, mm -hmm. That's a worthy prayer. I'm not saying it's going to make it all go away. But it's the first step in accepting the reality that you have. And so, again, you know, how, how did I get over a girl that I thought I could never live without? Well, eventually I met another girl. Hi, Meredith. <laughs> um, 
eventually I, I, I realized, I mean, realized meaning reality, I, I believed that there was no truth to my pining. And so in that acknowledgement, I, 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 I don't know, the, the pining died. Now, again, he, I, I haven't been in a situation where that just didn't happen. Mm-hmm. Right. Um, right. Well, like with yours, though, um, what, why did the, so did she end the relationship or did oh, you or was it mutual? All my bad, bad stuff. Oh, so oh. like a lot of times I did like the preemptive the preemptive breakup because I think you're going to break up with me and then I feel bad and I don't like, I want you back and then she's already moved on and it's just... I didn't do that. So I'm just very curious about like... My dirty laundry? How this, not your dirty laundry, but how emotionally this actually works because you got into an argument or somehow you got to a place where you're like, well, fine, I don't want to ever see you again. Fine, I don't want to ever see you nah, again either. No. And so you go away. That was that was never mind. It doesn't sound like that's quite what happened here either. But And so what is it? But you get it? to a point where you say, um, I think it's time to move on. Why? Like, um, why do you say that? I know now looking back that I said it because I was afraid that she would say it to me. Okay. I also definitely was a lustful young man who you just uh, had wandering bored. eyes. Okay. Um, and so there's all sorts of horrible, horrible reasons mm-hmm. that kind of come together into the young man not being able to think yet. You're not able to think till you're 25. And even then you're just barely starting. Like just the more you as a young man can be like, I'm missing brain parts still. I don't have a full <laughs> engine. So I'm just going to like maybe not assume I know, right? Yeah. Like that the, your decision making process is really muddled really muddled at that point especially if you've touched her already if there's some sort of bond going on there so um so again the codependency is is like you have you're at this point where you're like well for these reasons i don't want to be with her but then you go away and you've been relying on a certain emotional fulfillment and now that's gone and it's empty and you just don't know where else to go and you haven't found alcohol yet and so you're not a drunk yet you just want the girl back right and so again be be careful i say that tongue in cheek but be careful because codependency takes on many shapes and forms and if you have a tendency for codependency in relationships you're going to have a tendency for it in substance abuse as well and that doesn't include just alcohol this thing is like overeating there's like there's all sorts of places here so this is where the book boundaries i know we like every week right we preach the gospel of boundaries and it's another gospel because it's not the gospel okay but it, it really is, uh, and we're reading it as a family. The Bible quotes aren't that great. There's all sorts of actual things I disagree with it, but but it's really essential for dealing with codependency. You want to stop being codependent with people, then it's a boundary issue, and it's about self ownership. Is another way to look at it. Um, and as good as Jocko Willing's book uh, Extreme Ownership is, it's not going to quite do what boundaries does. So read boundaries first, then read Extreme Ownership, and they should pair real nicely together, read them at the same time. Um, but you need, so, you need a little more than just so chocolate. unpack like codependency a little bit more. What what is somebody it means struggling that, yeah, with? Yeah, you are you are not sufficient as a human being for your own emotions. Okay, so then what does that lead to? What does that look like? It leads to going to the other person to try to make you feel the way you want to feel, and so, they need to act a certain way for you okay. to feel the way you want to feel. And when they won't or don't or can't, then you are unable to be okay. Okay. And you will either take action to try to make them or you will shove them away to try to like go and like still control the scenario somehow. Got it. But you, what you don't have is the ability to say, I, the dog got out. Who let the dog out? Who let, <laughs> let the, the dog, dog out? out? Yeah. Um, <laughs> do we need to like, hello? It's Chloe, sorry. Thank Why you. Why are you banging on the door like that, Chloe? <laughs> um, it's like a werewolf. I um, well, I don't know what I was saying. Well, I did, we were talking about codependency and like how you're dependent upon the other person to oh, feel what for you, you need. What, yeah, and so the healthy human being, which this can apply to non-Christians as well as Christians, but Christians, since we have the hope of resurrection, like it should be easier for us, but it's often mm-hmm. not because we just haven't dealt with it. We're too busy watching shows and stuff, right? The healthy human being is one who is able to to lose any re- <laughs> to lose any relationship in life and not despair over it as yeah. if life itself were lost okay okay oh okay so 
like if I codependency, my codependency upon you, mm -hmm. which has existed, does still exist. Mm -hmm doesn't exist the way that it did and i can tell you why because if you died i'd be okay that'd be crazy don't really want you to right but if you did i'd be okay so so that's the level you have to be at in any relationship to not be entirely codependent but that's just it so these we love each other we're gonna be together forever and then she dies how are you gonna feel mm -hmm. right like like what if your spouse dies in the first year of marriage how are you gonna do like it'll no don't me wrong it's gonna hurt it's gonna it's always gonna hurt it's not about not having pain it's about believing you will be able to go through the pain and codependency means you you don't believe you're able to go through the pain you can't live without so as you talk about this i'm thinking about our media saturated world and how um if i want to feel happy i watch a comedy if i want to feel like i've done something great i go watch an adventure movie if i if i hallelujah you know, <laughs> Spill my coffee. <laughs> coffee. It just wants to jump out of the cup today. <laughs> it's bound for the desk. Um, so it would seem that being media saturated creates or breeds a codependent society. I think a lot of people are codependent on media in the first place. Right. Um, and as a result, what you tend to do is avoid dealing with what you actually have mm -hmm. and borrowing the dreams of others as surrogate emotions which again is its own codependency but then because you have a a stilted soul a mm -hmm. stunted soul um you're going to then project those same kind of imaginary realities onto everybody else around you right and so you're very likely to develop other forms of codependency. I mean, guys don't just watch football. They watch football and drink beer, right? Like, like it, things go together. And I'm not against football or beer per se, right? Um, uh, although idolatry of such things is, is bad and codependency definitely bad. Um, okay, uh, so our friend, Mr. Frost, mm -hmm. um, might do well to figure out what it is that he... Um, like, what, what causes one to detach from their own ability to self-soothe <laughs> you know essentially codependency it sounds like you have no ability to self that's correct soothe. that is correct and so you're going and seeking continually mm -hmm. this comfort from other mm -hmm. whether it's people alcohol um yeah <laughs> adventure whatever i'm not self-soothing i'm i'm uh, this is it so though. yeah i mean not not that everyone who drinks coffee is but I definitely don't self-soothe yet. I have no idea how to self-soothe. I, I lean on this or cigars or or whatever, mm -hmm. you know. Yeah, so... Reading the Bible. <laughs> well, which uh, is fun because it's not... It is... It's not self-soothing, but it no. is the creator of you yeah. soothing you. It's like a good your place to go. ultimate father what, what is you. What is nice is that I've managed to inject into my codependent habits the thing which shall set me free from them. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, and uh, so that that's like very intentional. Uh, but ideally, um, I would be able to self-soothe rather than... Because we're talking psychology here a little bit too. Just how are my emotions? You know, how can, can I talk myself through the despair, the fear, the anger, whatever it might be. Um, can I feel my way out of it? And that's always like, you know, flashback. Hello. Uh, like the, the frustrating thing is like, you'd have this like heavy emotion and there's just, there's just no way out of it. It's just there. And it's just like, mm -hmm. and you're trying to, why is this thing? And do I have to say something about it? I don't know. So again, back to, um, Charles here, uh, you're you you need to develop a self-identity that exists apart from her and somehow that isn't there and it isn't her that made that happen it predates her it probably has to do with childhood i mean i don't think i'm going out on a limb I and mean, it's possible that it happened in adulthood that you were traumatized in adulthood but most people who are dealing with issues like this it has to do with childhood it has to do with parenting and 
often not just like not abusive parenting, but incompetent yeah. parenting, mm-hmm. um, which doesn't mean you have to hate your parents, but it does mean you have to acknowledge how much they hurt you and maybe face where and how they hurt you. And honestly, that's the only way you can forgive is to really like, you don't be like well, that wouldn't be forgiving. No, no, no. Forgiving means like you, you really face it. Oh no, they did this. And I, I hated that that happened. That hurt me so bad. I can never forget it. It's only after you're willing to say that, that, that forgiveness is, is possible. And so, forgiving is not forgetting. No. It doesn't no. mean you forget. Forgiving means you cancel the debt. Yeah. So they like don't that. owe you anymore. But you don't have to forget it. You don't pretend it didn't happen. Yeah. Yeah. Not not to your own emotions. Your emotions don't pretend it didn't happen. Your emotions acknowledge it happening and they're valid emotions. In Inju- mm-hmm. your emotions of injustice must be validated. And again, if you're codependent in the present, it means there's something in the past that has not been validated and dealt with. Um, so, yeah, um, you know, this was the you know, the what are you depressing thing from last week, right? Mm-hmm. Um, if you're depressed, you're depressing something. What is it? And uh, the man who said that to me uh, the first time, you know, four or five years ago now, mm-hmm. um, he kind of went on to say, you know. Uh, all that time, all my time, I was angry at my brother and I just didn't know it. And I remember thinking, oh, wow, I'm not angry at anybody when he said that. And mm. that guy's, <laughs> uh, I definitely uh, uh, have anger at my immediate family. There's just no way around it. And um, you know, what you do with that is a completely different thing than acknowledging that you have it. And if you won't acknowledge you have it, it's just going to be there and you're going to be trying to hide from it and you're going to hide in anything you can. You, you certainly can't soothe yourself when you won't admit who you are. And so, um, yeah, I, I really still have a question about like this actual relationship. Like you, you got to be friends and you got too close, but you never actually were together. It, it's really, it sounds strange to I me. Mean, I mean, I, I could potentially see a scenario where there was talk of engagement. Mm-hmm. You know, there was plans, future plans being kind of made but never getting to a point where we are engaged or we're actually going to be engaged Mm -hmm. it was you know I I can envision that and then the if if he um isn't is the type of man that would you know respect her and not want to touch her like maybe he held her hand to get out of a car or get up off the floor but you know it doesn't have to be a physical right so I mean, or like she had a guy already, but they were friends. And then it like, that's, that's what I thought a little bit. It was like, she's engaged, but mm -hmm. they're friends. And then it's getting Um, a little more than it should be. And now, but now I can't stop thinking of her and she's married and yeah. So again, now if she's married, that, that should make it easier to go back to this repent word. Like, okay, so what you are desiring is adultery and it is wrong. And there's Mm -hmm. only one answer and that's repent. Which means tell Jesus, I don't want to do this anymore. I don't, I don't. I don't want these emotions. I don't want these thoughts. I don't want to follow through on these thoughts. I know my flesh is ever with me. I know my sin is ever before me. And against you, you only have I sinned. Um, but I intend to walk the other way, dear Jesus. Please make my heart to align with your word on this thing. And then um, time. So uh, in and that recognizing the the qualities about her that you liked, <laughs> that you can't seem to let go of that that is what you're looking for in your wife ultimately so it's it's a good thing to know you can thank god for showing you this is the these are the qualities that i'm i'm interested in this is the type of person that i want Mm -hmm. to be married to i will say also codependency is a two-way street so um if you were codependent on her whether or not she was codependent on you she was enabling you and it's good that you're not together because you would have destroyed each other and so it's better to, to face this than to get into a scenario that ends up much worse 20 years from now. Uh, Psalm 38 is a good one for when like you just have too much inside. Uh, o Lord, do not rebuke me in your wrath, nor chasten me in your hot displeasure, for your arrows pierce me deeply and your hand presses me down. So you start out by acknowledging like, this is not without God. Like all the pain I'm feeling, like it's, it is in one way, it must be the just wrath of God upon me. And it, but acknowledging there is no soundness in my flesh 
because of your anger, nor any health in my bones because of my sin, right? So it's, all that I feel is this horrible pain, right? And it, we're not just talking like like a medical issue. We're talking psychological pain, right? For my iniquities have gone over my head like a heavy burden. They are too heavy for me. My wounds, think of your soul. My wounds are foul and festering because of my foolishness. I am troubled. I am bowed down greatly. I go mourning all the day long for my loins are full of inflammation. Now that one... NIV doesn't quite translate it like that. Um, we, we, they softened it a little bit. That's how I found out I had the NIV up this morning was I was like, that's not what it says. <laughs> the, uh, but the point here is, uh, again, yeah, so your your bowels, uh, your your loins, your the parts of you wherein your emotions are felt, both as a man and a woman in the deepest level and then express themselves, um, they are, they're, they're swollen, not in a sexual way per se, but in a... Um, uh, un- inflamed way right mm-hmm. all my when, when you're feeling this pain it's like your your soul's been inflamed right you 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 break a bone or something and it swells up right so your heart's just swollen up but not in a good way mm-hmm. right uh my mo- my loins are full of inflammation and there is no soundness in my flesh so acknowledging this is idolatry um i am feeble i am severely broken i groan because of the turmoil of my heart lord all my desire is before you my sighing is not hidden from you my heart pants my strength fails me, and for the light of my eyes, it is gone from me. My loved ones and my friends stand aloof. That that applies directly, I think, here, right? Um, I, like a deaf man, do not hear. I'm like a mute that does not open his mouth. I'm like a man who does not hear, and in whose mouth is no response. But in you, O oh Jesus, I hope. You will hear, O oh Lord my God. I said, hear me, lest they rejoice over me, because I'm ready to fall. My sorrow is continually before me. So I will declare my iniquity. I will be in anguish over my sin. But Lord, acknowledge my enemies are vigorous. They are strong. Those who hate me wrongfully have multiplied. Those who render evil for good, they are my adversaries. Do not forsake me, O Jesus. God, be not far from me. Make haste to help me, O Lord, my salvation. So, um, I mean, not every verse in there applies directly to, you know, getting getting broken up with. But the, it definitely is in that category of feeling. Um, and so I, you know, I would... In, uh, encourage you to pray this one and actually go in 38, 39 and 40 all in a row. They really kind of get deep into this part of the soul. And so I'd encourage you to do that like every day Mm. for five months, six months, seven months, like, like not for three days, right? Like every day, same, same Psalms, um, just drive them into you and see if it doesn't, you know, along with the prayer for God to change you. So, so God, I don't want to feel this way about this person anymore. I know that it's wrong. I know it's not sufficient. I know it's not reality. And then with that being where you're starting using these words every day for months, um, I mean, call me back, you know, if it, if it, if you need more. Um, but that would, that would be my, my practical advice. You picked up, picked up your Bible. You got something else? Well, no, I don't really. I just wanted to look at it to see when, if it said, like when David wrote this Psalm, mm. Psalm 38, and if it if it did have something to do with Bathsheba at all. I mean, I understand that you're, what you're saying um, about the, the inflamed loins, meaning that it's like your inner person, your deepest part of who you mm. are. But... I don't think it's not about the other thing at all. I'm just saying, like, you, you, t- t- let it let the metaphor express a soul reality rather than it just being like kind of a crass fleshly comment. Well, right? I mean, because he was anointed and because he was righteous, it. I wonder if there was a struggle between the time of seeing her and lusting for her and the time of actually acting on his lust. If there was any. Yeah. yeah. That's interesting. Story doesn't read that way, but yeah. 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 And then potentially after the act was done, like what kind of remorse did he feel? Yeah. Being a man of God. Mm -hmm. I don't know. Was it, did it say it's a by David? It is I by David, and then it's to bring to remembrance. Oh, interesting. Yeah, it does sound like it's after. So, I don't... Yeah. I'm curious uh, what Kyle and Dalich Black Books on the Shelf would say. Do you want me to get it? No, nah, so I mean, I don't think it'd be through. quick. I don't think it'd be quick, and we've got to okay. move ahead for the sake of our <clears> children <throat> who don't want to leave them too long at... 
<laughs> the place they're at. Although it's a good place to be. Um, so next question is going to deal with uh, not completely distinct kinds of things. Uh, dear Pastor Fisk, my wife filed once for divorce, but I canceled it and agreed to attend counseling. However, she canceled that counseling. Mm -hmm. She canceled the counseling days before and filed a second time for divorce. It finalized last week. It's been a long and hard 11 months. I found out later that she had met someone else. My question is about divorce, moving on, and the possibility of remarriage. I feel that I do not want to marry again or even date again. My heart is still, even after everything, with my wife. I have friends, many Christians, that say because of her actions, I am now free to remarry. But some say I need to continue standing for my marriage and God will bring her around one day. So I'm going to kind of just jump in here before we go on and um, uh, say, first off, in terms of remarriage, um, anybody who has been divorced, I really encourage you not to remarry anytime soon. And that can be a broad word, but I really mean it like if you're divorced and you're thinking about remarriage, like remarriage, like you're you're on the wrong track. Slow down. Um, uh, the whole issue with codependency and figuring out who you are by yourself and being able to self-soothe, like it, somehow in all of this, that's got to be dealt with before anything else. And then um, the idea that, uh, you know, some say I'm free to remarry. Some say I need to do this and she will come around. Um, I think you got to be really careful about making promises where there aren't promises. Uh, so there, you don't have any need to do anything right now. Uh, the point of Paul's text, which we're going to talk about in a moment, is you're actually free. You're free. And so we'll come back to that. But the idea that if I do this, then she'll come back, kill that. Kill that. That is not real. Uh, and and you are going to continue in idolatry that if God loves you, he will not let you have at that point. Um, I shouldn't say if God loves you. Because God loves you, he will, he will crush your idolatry. Um, so he says, I don't know what to think as I believe the Bible does leave it open for me since my wife has relations with another man. Um, again, yet yeah, you're free. That's We're going to come back to that. Uh, but I also feel the world loves a failed marriage and that I should continue to pray, which I am, for her to come back to God. Her beliefs over the past several years have led her away from God. Uh, switching here to another one. Um, she still thinks she is a Christian regardless of believing uh, hardly any of what is in the Bible to be true. She is more progressive liberal at this point. Uh, what do you believe the Bible says about the circumstance I find myself in? Uh, sincerely, DJK. And, and we've ha we've heard from him about this um, before and given advice before. Oh. Um, uh, so, so this must have been before the actual divorce took place that we talked to him. Mm -hmm. oh. Yeah. Um, and I think it's, you know, he was working on the counseling or... We advised that. I, I don't remember exactly. It's in the last couple of months that, that this was. So, wow. um, all right. So we're going to start with the Bible on this here. And you, you've already seen this, obviously, because you've been pointed to it. Uh, this is in 1 Corinthians chapter 7, big section on marriage. And verse 15 says, If the unbeliever departs, let him depart. A brother or sister is not under bondage in such cases, but God has called us to peace. And then verse 17, as God has distributed each one, as the Lord has called each one, so let him walk. Verse 21, were you called as a slave? Don't be concerned about it. But if you can be made free, rather use it. Right? So it's like, you're okay as you are. And that's the thing that ultimately self-soothing, to use that language again, is about, is being okay as, as you are. So, so you are free to remain as you are and pray for her as long as you don't think that that will guarantee she comes back. But if you're, the, the real goal would be to be able to be okay as you are the rest of your life without getting married again and, and to be okay with that. And then if some Christian girl shows up 10 years from now and like she's really nice and she likes you, like, you're not bound to not getting married. But you're not really free to go try to get married. I think that that would be, that would be, it would be stupid. I don't want to call it a sin per se. 
and the, 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 we're going to get into this too later with like, like, golly, st- stop trying to not sin as if somehow you're going to get away from your bad selfish <laughs> motives or something like that. Like you're suddenly I don't need Christ. Yeah. Well, I mean, yeah, it's like this. <laughs> that's exactly right. Um, like we have to be able to talk about things that are, uh, on a spectrum, on a scale of wise and foolish Mm -hmm. without being like, well, which one's sin and which one's not, you know, Mm -hmm. like you're, you're not helping yourself make good decisions. You're not being wise at that point. Um, the language of sin in the Bible is reserved generally for things that are extreme evils that you act on. Right. Um, which most of us aren't doing a lot of that. Although, although there, you know, pornography, that'd be one. Um, but uh, or it is reserved for the inherited nature of man that you you can't get away from. You're not gonna you're not going to not have sin in you. And so, more important here is like, okay, what is what is good? What is better? What is best? Um, what is wise? What is foolish? And so to to come out of a divorce of any kind and try to get married or decide I'm going to get married again. Like that's foolish. What you want to decide is to be at peace with what happened to find out what you did and who you are that contributed to it. Cause ultimately it just, it takes two to tango. I mean, it's not in the Bible, but it's just like there, there are two people involved and it's never just one of them doing the bad. Okay. So how do you come to terms with being at peace and not being the codependent or whatever person that you were. And by the time that you have found peace with Jesus living as you are, he will provide for you what he wants to give you. And so to if, if you can't imagine life without marriage again, to say, Jesus, can you please help me become healthy so that I can have a marriage someday and only bring that marriage at the time when it's right so this doesn't happen again? Like, that's fine. That's a fine prayer. Um, but again, you, you actually, you, you don't have to get married again either. Like, there's just, you, you can just be free. To cling to the idea that she's coming back to you is folly. Mm. It doesn't mean it's not possible. It, it is actually possible that someday whatever relationship she's in falls apart, that she repents of all ungodliness. I mean, I don't know what she doesn't believe in. I got to take your word for it. You know, Jonah isn't real, evolution, racial justice, blah, 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 blah. Right. So, so someday that all crashes down around her head and she's like, oh, I need Jesus again. I need to believe the Bible's true. And she spends years becoming a healthy person again. And then she's like, you know what? I wonder if my ex husband from 15 years ago is a healthy person now. Um, and then she looks you up and says, I'm sorry. I hope you're happy. Um, uh, and you know, can I send you Christmas cards? And you're like, I'm still single. Let's talk. You know, like, like you can't plan this. You're better off being free and just being free. And then let Jesus do whatever he wants later, but give all of your energies to, um, a spirit of repentance in this scenario that seeks to mature your own wisdom, particularly with regard to your own psychology and how it was a part of this. Because if you're gonna if you're gonna try to act like it was all somebody else, now you really are just gonna stay exactly where you are. Um, so, uh, what else do I got for Bible here? Not that one. It's not even a thing. I don't know if that one even matters. So I'm going to let you start talking while I look at the Bible over here. As I think about this scenario, I think about, um, oh, let's see. I just have to grab one of my thoughts. (laughs) Um, How how oftentimes when we're in a certain state of life, we try to hold on to that state of life after it's gone. Um, yeah. And not just accept this new chapter as being what is in front of us and what God is going to use. Um, your ability now to focus on other things, like Paul talks about how um, those who are never married are able to focus more clearly on spiritual things because mm-hmm. they are not tied to the worries of of this life 
as much. And so... What? I'm thinking about the Jeep again. I just, just, just like... <laughs> You idolatrous fool, you. And so to to be unfortunately given that opportunity in this scenario mm. where, yeah, you, you no longer have a wife to worry about. You have more time to, to focus on prayer. And what is God going to mm. use? I mean, what is he going to do as he uses that time to mold and shape you? Like the sky's the limit from this you can become more bitter or you can become better. And I think putting our focus into um, God's word makes us better. I know it, it is does. Better. It, it is, is better. better. And so you're going to be a stronger person from this this tragedy that you're living through. Uh, my son, do not despise the chastisement of Jesus. Uh, it's uh, Proverbs 3, I believe. Did you find what you're looking for? Um, I did. It it isn't really as connected to what you said, which was really good. It's Thank you. on the idea that, okay, so she says she's still a Christian, but she's living in adultery with somebody else. Now I'm taking your word for it, but like, okay, so fornication and all uncleanness and covetousness, let it not be even named among you. It's not fitting among the saints. For you know this, that no fornicator, unclean person, or covetous man, an idolater, has any inheritance of the kingdom of Christ and God. So this is where, again, our, our language about sin and it's like every little thing's a sin and, and you're like, oh, I'm an idolater at heart because I, you know, I, I have misguided emotions. Like, no, no, no. This is talking about like you, you actually are living in adultery and saying it's okay and it doesn't matter. Okay. You just got to know you're not a Christian now. You don't care what you think you are. No, oh, Jesus loves me. Well, speaking but, but to the then, wife. then, yes, right. then, then speaking <laughs> to the wife. So repent wife. Mm -hmm. Right. And you, it's not your place to say this to her, but. The fact is you're not a Christian if you are living in fornication and saying it's okay and Jesus doesn't care. That is like the definition of a hearted heart, hardened yeah. heart. And uh, so Ephesians 5, uh, 3 through 6 is is pretty clear. But let no one deceive you with empty words. But but I believe. Uh, you know, yeah, show me your works by what you do, James says. And uh, uh, <laughs> we'll get a more conversation about works and faith here uh, in a moment too. So but, as you led him to look at himself and repent, you know, there's two to tango, it takes two to tango, um, from an outsider's view, or maybe even a culture that promotes divorce, it's her fault, she's the one, he's the victim, um, but then at the same time, like, somebody doesn't just become no. a, an unbeliever just overnight, like, and so falling for her beautiful smile, or, you know, not having her faith be the most important thing or in the if she had faith and it's been lost like where were you adam you know right it's a good rule of thumb that there is no innocent party in a divorce no one's a victim mm -hmm. you both divorced you both brought to that relationship the seeds of divorce now can you find, can someone find an exception to that rule? I'm pretty sure you can. I'm pretty sure I've even heard it. It's terrifying. <laughs> oh. Uh, his, his, they were in a car accident. Mm -hmm. She had brain damage, changed her personality. She left him. Oh. Now, again, that was his story. Mm -hmm. So then again, you know, good rule of thumb. I found myself in a divorce. I'm probably at fault at least 50%. <laughs> and so again, Repentance, meaning a position of assuming I can grow and become better than I am, mm -hmm. and that forgiveness in Christ is the freedom to believe in the grace of God toward me, that that's what he wants, that his goal is not to chastise unto damnation, but it is to prune unto healthy growth. It's a good place to be. And then ask, so, so it's not what did she do that needs to change. It's what what can I do better to be who I am now since I don't have her anymore. And that's evident. Yeah. I've got to live without her. How am I going to be content, single the rest of my life? And well, I don't know how I'll be content, single. I'd love to be married, but Jesus, don't send me another one. Don't send me another woman until I am content, single. And then send me another woman. Once I'm content single, get me out of it. Yeah, but but uh, not until 
I'm going to adjust whatever. And so, oh Lord, preserve me from hidden sins. Uh, is, which one is that? Um, is that that's not 51. Uh, Psalm, uh, oh Lord, preserve me from hidden sins. Like, uh, which man knows his errors? Well, no, we, you, we don't all. But this is like, you just had a big mirror held up, and so it's like, well, let's let's go dig. Mm-hmm. Again, can I say boundaries is a good place to start? It's a good place to start. Um, that book will open up some things. Something that he said in his question made me remember that our just how pro-divorce we are as a culture and how sad that is especially if you're going through a scenario where um let's just face it all marriages go through rocky times and they become stronger because of it as you get from one end of that mountain trek to the other you as a couple become more unified and stronger but as you're going through it, it's oftentimes really hard because we desire to have a support group. We desire to have somebody that we can go to and talk to about, wow, I'm just having so much trouble right now. And yet the common advice is, oh, well, you better leave because if you're not happy, that's, you know, that's the worst thing you could do for yourself is to be in a scenario where you're not happy. And that's just not helpful. Mm -mm. It's not helpful at all, especially when you're being beaten down by this this hike you're on and you need somebody to bolster you up and give you some water, give you a protein bar and say, hey, keep on going. Instead, they're like, oh, well, here, I'll pick you up in my parachute and you can go over there to the, the lake. <laughs> it's like, Push you off what? the rock. Mm. Yes. And it's just, yeah. it doesn't. So if your friend, if your neighbor is coming to you, I guess is what I'm saying. And saying, I'm going through some hard time, it's not the time to say, oh, well, here, let's let's just jump ship. Mm-hmm. That's what you need. Be happy. Jump ship. It's not, nobody needs that. Be happy. It's not about happy. We're going to move on to Azukar, who says, and this is, this is the one about repentance. So, um, why do you tell us we need to repent of things that aren't sins? <laughs> For example, you told women to repent of a bad decision when talking about marrying a man that they feel is a bad head. Isn't this legalism? Now, Azukar, um, me no think him is what you think him is, and that, that much is pretty much evident here, right? So if you married a non-Christian... It's not a sin in the sense of you murdered somebody, but you didn't listen to the word of God. That's a sin. Okay. Does that mean I'm going to hell? Are you accused? No, I'm, this is why the sin language just doesn't help us right now. We should reserve the language of sin for Bible passages that use the word sin and stop holding it as the end all be all of whether or not I'm okay with God. Because what it does is it confuses you. Um, when I say repent of a bad decision, mean I mean, acknowledge, I made a bad decision. Hey, Jesus, I made a bad decision. That's all I mean. It, it doesn't mean that I'm going to hell now. Uh, no, I mean, you have a relationship with Jesus. You're not going to hell, right? Um, legalism, legalism would be telling you that if you don't do this or that, which is not prescribed by the Bible, then you're going to hell. Where have we said that? Where, where have I said you you know you you had a bad marriage? You're going to hell. Where have I said that? So legalism is like here's some legalism for you. If you don't eat carnivore diet, you're not a Christian. That'd be legalism, okay? Now someone's going to quote that, put it in a meme or something, right? It's like <laughs> like like that'd be legalism. That'd be bad. That'd be wrong. It'd be evil, okay? Telling you to change the direction you're going, or to admit you were going in a bad direction, and ask for Jesus to remind you of grace in that moment is not legalism; it's grace. Mm. So again, maybe I'm overreacting here a little bit, and I don't, you know, you know, I get I get emotional as a car, so you know, take it take it as the show and not anything personal. Um, but again, I, uh, why do you tell us to repent of things that aren't sins? I'm I'm asking you to stop. So there's this thing you're doing, it's hurting you. And I'm like, own it as hurting you. And as uh, Darth Mick just said in the comments from my previous conversation, look, repentance is a good rule of thumb. <laughs> it's just, it, repentance is the posture of the Christian. Yeah. Okay. 
it's not legalistic to say that our general posture is one of acknowledging all that we do is sin. Our best works are filthy rags. And so in any given moment, there's nothing wrong with saying, you know, Jesus, I, I probably messed it up. Like, it doesn't have to be like, thou shalt not. And if, and because uh, your whole thou shalt not question is like, well, what do you think you're going to do? Stop sinning? Do, do you really, I mean, do you think you don't sin? Do you think you're not living in sin? Do you think it's not always with you? Is, your, is, your, is evil not close at hand at all times? Even when you want to do good, don't you end up doing like not as good as you could? Or, or when you do some good, you did it for a selfish reason? Like, so, like, what kind of metric are you using? I, so, me no think him is what you think him is. I think we're using different language. Mm-hmm. Yeah? You and I. And so, um, why do I keep telling people to repent of things that aren't sins? I, I'm, I'm, I'm telling them to stop doing things that hurt them and acknowledge that they did it. Right? Which means also acknowledging, if you're a Christian, that, that Jesus has got you. Um. I'm not really telling them to like put on sackcloth and make sacrifices of atonement, right? Like, no, no, no. We're on the other side of that. Like, I mean, you can put on sackcloth if you want, but the, the, the atonement has been done. So I'm not asking for atonement when I say repent. That that would be legalism. I don't know. I I'm I'm kind of confused by your question. Well, I I think about the times that I've had conversations with our kids about mistakes like it really tears them up Mm. when um we have to point out that that there's been a mistake right Uh, right. you're doing something like you said that's harmful right so you need to stop right and something that I've uh it was it was revealed to me through reading and so I repeat it to them is it's only a mistake if you refuse to learn from it. And the only way that we can refuse to learn from it, or it, that, that we can learn from it, is to recognize that I did make a mistake. So, like, so it's not I, only a mistake. It's I just the first word to, confused me. But I have to see that I've done something that didn't work out the way that I wanted it to mm-hmm. in order to change my behavior in the future so that it cannot have that same result correct um now for a person who has married a non-christian it's recognizing that um that i allowed myself to be led by things that really aren't of a spiritual nature you know i ignored clear warnings in the word of god about how bad this was going to be if i did it Mm -hmm. and now Heavenly Father, I'm going to reap the benefit. The benefits. I'm going to reap the consequences of mm-hmm. my actions, mm-hmm. and so guide me through that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, that is the repentance that would go there. Uh, Full Metal Jedi quotes the first thesis of the 95 Thesis, which says, "When our Lord Jesus and Master said, repent, He willed that the entire life of believers be one of repentance." So, I guess I'm a Lutheran. Hmm. Um, yeah. No, what you say is really good there. Um. So, like, can we just distinguish between living a life of repentance as a Christian in which I acknowledge that I have failed to listen to the word of God and living the life of a wicked person who does great evil, mm-hmm. right? Who who does not repent of anything. Oh. So you have often recently defined sin as missing the mark. Mm-hmm. And so if you take that definition and apply it, to our lives mm-hmm. i mean how often do you miss the mark how often do you sin when you're pouring yourself a cup of coffee <laughs> or how every often... time i spill <laughs> and not because i spill it's because what i say you when miss i spilled your yeah. mark how yeah. often do you sin when you're sprinkling salt on your meal so like, like how many times you have a ring of salt right. around your plate did you miss your mark did you sin well yeah are you, is but, it, you, but you're saying that without this hyper-spiritualized final judgment day exactly. kind of uh, fill in the blank to it. Hebrew is, Hebrew has like eight different words mm-hmm. translated as sin and not a single one of them initially is spiritual. They're all missing the mark. They're all, hmm. there's financial ones. There's they're, they're all just dealing with like lines that aren't straight, right? And then we realize through the course of revelation that there is, that all of that applies to everything that we are. 
that we've inherited this corruption and that our attempt to justify ourselves, to straighten our own lines, justification is the same thing, a straight line, bent line, right? You justify it, you straighten it out. Um, uh, our attempts to justify ourselves by not sinning is the greatest sin that there is because we think we can somehow hold ourselves up before God and say, look, look at what I've done as opposed to be reliant upon the mercy of God in all things, and then thereby withhold the hand from missing the mark on purpose when it's going to hurt somebody else specifically. And that's where the Ten Commandments are the chief sins because they directly hurt other people, which spilling your salt only directly hurts slugs if they're under the salt when it falls. Um, yeah. I've dropped chocolate like two times since we got Aurelius. And I'm always like, where's the chocolate? Get the chocolate. <laughs> I mean, dogs have arrived eating chocolate. I know, cake, but so I'm I just, it's okay. I just don't want to hurt my puppy. Um, but yeah, so um, the, the recognition that sin as a word was not initially a spiritual word. It doesn't mean that that spiritual application doesn't have a place in our understanding of our forgiveness on the day of judgment. It does. But, the fallen condition of man is much bigger than just wickedness. Our reason is skewed. Um, our, our bodies are falling apart. There's thorns in the ground, right? All of that is the result of the sinful condition. And um, yeah, uh, repenting of mistakes um, doesn't mean equating them with murder and adultery, um, but it, it means turning your back on the error which you can do for anything, but then especially if the Bible says, like, you know, this is unwise, you know, then it is a sin, but, like, stop overreading the word and, like, it, you turn your back on that twisted way of thinking. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. One more. We'll let that one go. Hey, I really appreciate that question, and I'm sorry if I yelled at you too much. Um, that would, you know, I get, I get emotional. I really do. And I, I, I think that's why you watch, <laughs> but I don't want it to hurt you. Um, thank you for answering my follow-up question on faith and good works and the Athanasian creed. We're back. We're back to this one here. Um, <laughs> oh, your facial expression. Yeah. Well, we're, me think. <laughs> we're talking past each other at this point. And so mm -hmm. I, I just want, I, this is probably the last time I answer this. Not that I'm mad at you, but it's like, I don't know. I don't know how to help you. Um, I feel like like you're not being obstinate in a mean way or a bad way. Obtuse is maybe the better word. Like you're 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 thinking's your own worst enemy right now. Like you're just you're overthinking this thing, and you've got yourself painted into a corner that the only way out is to leave Lutheranism. And okay, you know if if if, if you want to go to Rome, I mean you you can. Um, it's got a fascinating fight going on. They could use some good warriors right now. But, you know, go be a Trentine Catholic. You know, Vatican II, schism the church. The current pope is not really the pope. Like, by all means, like, have a, have a blast. Um, it's They need good men. But uh, I really just think it's so much simpler than you're making it. Uh, so he says, I've watched your answer a couple times, and unfortunately, my confusion has only grown when I think about Articles 4, 5, and 6 of the Augsburg Confession as they relate to what Scripture teaches. Okay, so four is you are justified by grace through faith. Five is the way you have this happen is that somebody preaches to you and then the Lord's Supper does it too. And then six is the result of this is that you are a better person. You want to be a better person. You will seek to be a better person. But in particular, he says, Article 6 says, because they do talk about remission of sins in Article 6, for remission of sins and justification is apprehended by faith. Mm-hmm. He says, but some Bible verses started coming to my mind that seemed to contradict this passage. Wait. Okay, so we're going to look at all these verses. But So you're telling me the verses you're going to quote say that, the, that, that justification is not apprehended by faith. Okay, because there's verses that say that it is. So I don't care how many verses you find about random stuff that you can read into it, a different way of thinking. You need to find verses that say you're not saved by faith alone through grace alone. Find those verses. And you got James 2, okay. Yeah, sure. But again, put that one in its context and you're still standing alone. And what do you do when you have a verse that says you're saved by faith alone and you have a verse that says you're not saved by faith alone? What do you do? Which one do you throw out? I don't throw either of them out. 
The one that's talking about my relationship with God, saved by faith alone. I just, it says justified. Justified by faith alone. The one that's talking about my relationship with my neighbor, justified by works alone. Ha. <laughs> okay, so so again, find me the verse that says, on judgment day, you're going to be judged on your works alone and not by faith alone. And all those other verses about faith alone, they don't count. They're not true, right? Because again, you're, you're, what you're going to quote here is like, I'm going to give an example. When I'm in a conversation with the Calvinists about the Lord's Supper, and I'm like, this is my body. This is my body. This is my body. This is my, four times it says that. This is my body. And they're like, but he's ascended into heaven. Okay, you didn't quote the Bible now, right? You, you didn't say the Bible says this is not my body. And so I'll be like, okay, so uh, he who does not eat my flesh and drink my blood, he has no part with me, right? And and there's they're like, um, uh, but human bodies can't do that. But wasn't he sitting in the upper room with the disciples when he gave it the Lord's Supper? Like, none of that is actually a quote from the Bible about what we're talking about. All of that is some other thing that you have to do like three backflips with to get to a philosophical idea by which you can kind of claim that what the Bible says isn't true. Why? Why? Now, I'm talking to Calvinists at that point, right? And I wrote a book for all y'all. Every single Calvinist out there, I've been accused of it. How dare Fisk write a book not for Lutherans? Without flesh is written for you. Um. All right. I know, i just trying to sell my book to my enemy. It's not not really going to work out so well. But anyway, so so you say you've got some Bible verses that say that the remission of sins is not apprehended by faith. Okay, so all they're saying is that when Jesus says, I forgive you, the only way to like know that is to believe it. That's all it says, right? And, and so you say, um, when Jesus gives us the Lord's Prayer in Matthew, he says, and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. That seems to be, seems to be, seems to be a conditional request. Okay, so, so you're going to take something that isn't talking about the topic and you're going to make it a condition that you then use to undo the rest of Scripture. Okay, why? Why not have Scripture be in harmony? Um, it seems to be a conditional request. So Jesus teaches us to pray for forgiveness, not based on faith alone, that God will forgive us freely on account of Christ, but based on faith plus something we need to do, forgive our debtors. So, so you're saying from that one little bit that Jesus undoes everything else that Paul says in the New Testament about salvation by grace through faith and not by works. And instead, Jesus is saying that you must earn forgiveness by forgiving people. I mean, you're really taking a big jump there. We're going to look at that text. But after we look at some other texts, um, uh, da, 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 this implies we need, to do, we need to do something to be forgiven. No, it doesn't. It doesn't. You're saying that. You apparently want to believe that. but And that is the natural flesh's most obvious religion is that I must make my own atonement. Okay? So you're really denying the salvific reality of the death of Jesus Christ because of something that guy said. Like, he, he died for you. Why are you pitting his words against his work for you? It's really strange again. Um, uh... Uh, before we can be justified and forgiven, uh, it's not free, at least in the sense so often it seems to be implied, right? So, I mean, yeah, you, you sound like a Roman Catholic, which I guess, I mean, sad. Um, and and this, this one's even weirder to me. Also in Luke 18 with the Pharisee and the tax collector, it says, but the tax collector standing far off would not even lift up his eyes to heaven, but be distressed, saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I tell you, that man went down to his house justified rather than the other. So Jesus is teaching that the tax collector did a work demonstrating humility that made him justified while the Pharisee boasted in works that did not avail for justification. So now you're distinguishing between various kinds of works so you can have one be saving works and one not be saving works. Um, that's, that's, that's an insane argument you just made to me. That the tax collector is an example of justification by works? I love you. I'm confused. I'm confused. It, it, you're, 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 the straws you are grasping for um, James two is a much better argument. Which is go back to James two, and then and then I mean, you don't believe what we're saying. Which okay, you know I I, I can't make you. Uh, so it seems like this is an example of remission of sins and forgiveness being received only by faith. Rather they were um, this isn't. Rather they were received and justification happened because the tax collector did something that contributed to his justification. Where where is that in the text? He's at the back and says have mercy. Not, I brought something to exchange, which is my obedient submission, right? He says, I have mercy. Um, 
And wh- what do you think brought him to, to that point? Why is he at the temple? The, how does he know the temple exists? The word of God has already come to him. There is no saving yourself without the word of God coming to you. Oh, but you have to then respond. Okay, well, okay. You're not a Lutheran. I, get, I mean, if that's what you want me to say to you, um, I think biblically, though, you're, you're basing this on a text that just is not at all about that. In fact, it's about the opposite of what you're saying. It's about how if you're going to stand before God and say, well, I have something to bring, he's going to be like, you're not justified. And now you're going to turn that very story into one about having the right stuff. It's the right stuff to bring. It's, it's very, very upside down. Um, and to think that humility is the saving act and pride is not, right? Okay, so I'm so humble, I'll be saved. Well, that'll work out. Uh, and you want some humility? Stop thinking it's about you. Golly. And uh, we're going to look at this briefly, but the word humility in the Bible means afflicted afflicted. How, how are you going to go out and be afflicted by your own action? You can't even do it. You cannot make humility. You can be humbled before God as he crushes you. That doesn't justify you. Crushing Christ justified you. But you got to add to it. Oh, really? An incomplete Jesus. So as you can see, I'm only more confused at the moment. Yes, George. I, I Yes. I, I think... Um, I mean, if you're willing to accept that from me, yes, you're very confused. And it's simpler than you think, but you just have to believe the obvious things Scripture says about it, which is that you're wrong. Scripture says you're wrong. I'm going to show you, okay? Um, and then we'll look at the text that you just quoted. Uh, but uh, uh, the plain meaning of the words of Scripture seem to be that justification received not— So no, there's no plain meaning. No, nowhere does it say justification is received not by faith. It doesn't say that. As I was always taught, it, no, it doesn't say that. None of those verses say that. There's no plain meaning. You are doing mental hoop jumping to get to the meaning in those texts. Um, they actually seem to be meaning we are justified by faith plus something God expects us to do, forgive others, show humility instead of pride. Okay, so there's a cart and there's a horse. Which one is which? Grace and works. Is grace the horse or is grace the cart Lutherans say grace is the horse that means works are being pulled by the horse there's there's no like and therefore there's no works okay grace creates the works in you justification by grace alone creates the works in you that's article 6 it creates the works in you it makes you do the works so to say that you have to forgive others when if, if Jesus said you have to forgive others which he kind of does to say, well, that means I must save myself by forgiving others. You have just imported a million things into that text. Jesus is talking to you because you're already saved and saying, because you're already saved, you have to forgive others. That is not to save you. That is the result of salvation. The horse is grace. It's pulling the cart of works. It's really, really simple. One comes first. The Savior saves you first. And then you're good or better. Striving for it. And humility teaches you to see that, oh yeah, I'm really not that great, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask him to make me better. But you want to make humility the thing that's going to make you great. Oh, you're, it's upside down, man. Upside down. Okay, so um, here, we're going to do a little catalog. We're going to start with Hebrews 6, um, which is not the most obvious one, but we're going to go through the rest of the not by works phrases. Because you're, you're, you're telling me the plain words of scripture say that it's not by faith alone, but you must add works. Okay. So what about all the plain words of scripture that say, and I'm going to quote it, not by works. Now, I'm not going to have a story about something that I'm going to say means not by works. I'm going to show you Bible verses, multiple ones that say not by works. Plain meaning, right? Now, this one isn't quite there yet. This is the setup, but pretty close. Hebrews 6, 1. Therefore, leaving the discussion of the elementary principles of Christ, let us go on to perfection, not laying again the foundation from repentance of repentance from dead works and faith toward God. Okay? Now, you maybe want to say, well, there's living works that then create faith or something, right? Or that faith is the living work. But it doesn't say that. It calls works dead, and it calls faith the foundation. Now he's saying here, let's move on past that. Let's like talk about like Melchizedek because the lore is amazing. But the foundation is faith, not works. He just said it. It's pretty plain. It's going to get plainer. Um, oh, uh, let's leave Proverbs for later. Um, Romans uh, chapter two, 
Verse 4. Or do you despise the riches of his goodness, forbearance, and longsuffering, not knowing that the goodness of God leads you to repentance? The goodness of God that leads you to repentance. So any works you're doing, what are they? They're the result of the goodness of God. What is that? His mercy toward you, his promises, his word. So the works are what you're led to by the saving actions of God. Cart horse, right? Uh oh. We'll skip that little thing there. Okay, here we go. Ephesians 2 8. For by grace you have been saved through faith. That was pretty plain by itself, right? You just said it doesn't teach that. You told me the Bible doesn't teach that. You've always been taught it, but it doesn't teach it because of the tax collector. For by grace you have been saved through faith and lest you be confused. That not of yourselves. It is the gift of God. Here it is. You see it? Not of works. You see that? Not of works. Not of works. Why? Because works is pride. So you want to be humble by looking at your own works. Not going to work. You're going to be more proud. Not of works. Okay? Here we go. We're on the, we're on the, the down, downward slope. Galatians uh, 2.16. Knowing that man is not justified by works of the law, but by faith in Jesus Christ. Can it get more clear? Romans 4, Abraham was justified by works. If uh, if Abraham was justified by works, he has something to boast about. Oh, like the, like the Pharisee, right? But not before God. Uh, he doesn't have anything to boast about before God. So what does the scripture say? It says Abraham believed, that'd be faith, and it was counted to him for righteousness. Now to him who works, the wages are not counted as grace, but as debt. But to him who does not work, there it is. Do you see it? Do you see it? Not work not work. He who does not work, but believes, oh, there's the faith, on him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is counted to him for righteousness. Oh, and David thought this too. Blessed are those whose lawless deeds are forgiven. Because it's about forgiveness of sins. And maybe that's been missing in this conversation so far. It's about forgiveness of sins. The tax collector went home forgiven because he needed to be. The Pharisee didn't think he needed to be forgiven because he had his works Romans 10, uh, excuse me, Romans 9, yeah, Romans 9, verse 10. In order that the purpose of God's election, is there a fly in here? Yeah. Where'd he show up from? And I is he like right know. right on the, on the microphone? Goodness. In order that the purpose of God's, oh, excuse me, in order that the purpose, that the purpose of God according to election might stand, there's a whole thing about what that means, but, Notice what it says, that the purpose of God, according to election, might stand not of works, but of him who calls. So we've had Romans 2, Ephesians 2, Galatians 2, Romans 4, Romans 9. Do you want more? They all said not of works. Here we go. First, 2 Timothy 1. Therefore, do not be ashamed of the testimony of our Lord, nor of me as prisoner, but share with me in the sufferings of the gospel according to the power of God. Verse 9, God, who has saved us and called us with the holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace, which was given to us in Christ before time began. Wow, that seems deep. Still more. Titus chapter 3. But when the kindness and the love of God our Savior toward man appeared, verse 5, not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us through the washing of regeneration, renewing of the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out on us abundantly through Jesus Christ our Savior, that having been justified by his grace, we should become heirs according to the hope of eternal life. This is a faithful saying. And now you want to go to Jesus, Matthew chapter 6, verse 14, and make all that not true. I'm going to go here and have this verse be true and those verses be true. How? When Jesus says, for if you forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive men their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive you. I see that as cart behind the horse where the horse is Jesus has already saved me. And now he's telling me as one who is saved that if I want to reject the salvation, 
which is a posture of repentance and forgiveness toward my neighbors, then I will reject the salvation. So again, I, I this is the election mystery. I can cast myself out of the faith. That is very possible. And that will be done by works. And so what is he saying here? He's saying love forgiveness. Since you're going to ask for, give, for forgiveness, see that that's what forgiveness creates. Uh, but this isn't like the end-all be-all of salvation. It's about faith, about trusting him. If you, The parable of the merciful servant, right? Unmerciful servant. He was forgiven and then he chose not to forgive, but he was already forgiven. He believed he was forgiven, right? He, he understood. And then he turned and did evil more to the point where he did not believe. Uh, you want to go again to the tax collector. He spoke this parable to some who look at this, look who he's talking to, who trusted in themselves that they were righteous hmm. and despised others. Which would not be humility, I suppose, then, huh? Um, two men went up to the temple to pray, one a Pharisee, the other a tax collector. The Pharisee stood and prayed thus with himself, God, I thank you, I'm not like other men, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even as this tax collector. I fast twice a week, I give tithes of all that I possess. I mean, he did what he was supposed to do, actually. It's a good man. The tax collector standing far off would not so much as raise his eyes to heaven, but beat his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. And, and you want that to be the one work that saves you? I mean, you're, you're really confusing. It's like you just don't want it, you know. I tell you, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other, for everyone who exalts himself will be humbled. So you're going to do the one work of not exalting yourself. You're going to, you're going to humble yourself to not exalt yourself so that you can be saved. That, that's exalting yourself. You're refusing to admit the position that you're actually in, which is a dead man. He who humbles himself will be exalted. And that's, that's the Proverbs. Did I? Yeah, Proverbs 3. Um, which shows up in First Peter, shows up in James. It's a fantastic verse. I think is key to understanding the posture of repentance. Uh, he scorns the scornful. He gives grace to the humble. But the word humble there means afflicted. It doesn't mean the person who's, who sits there and says, oh, I'm so humble now. It's the person who has been afflicted by him and acknowledges I deserve it. Now, that's not a work you're doing. That's the result of his work. So the cart is being pulled by the horse and the horse is the word of God in his truth as law and gospel combined. And so since you know, I mean, because because his condemnation alone, without the knowledge that he's a gracious God, that's going to make you run away from him, right? But the knowledge that he's a gracious God calls you, calls you back to him. And that call is his work. So even afterwards, when you're believing and you cooperate in that belief, because there is an activity that your belief has, Faith passively receives what's said, but then it acts on what it believes, right? Um, that is all the result of him. So it's by grace through faith and not by works that you are saved. But you're going to live with a lot of people doing good things. You're just, you're just not going to like hold it up to God and expect to get paid for it. Like you want to get paid for your humility. Does that make any sense? The wise shall inherit glory, but shame shall be the legacy of fools, right? And that's, that's, again, when you put your faith in your works, shame is what you will get. Shame is what you will get. Now, I had this other Proverbs verse over here. I'm trying to remember why I pulled that one out. It's really good. But it's, uh, so we're, I'm just going to run through it again. So here we go. Um, Ephesians 2, verse 9, not of works. Galatians 2, verse 16. Not justified by works of the law. Romans 4. As grace. Right? Um, oh, there, uh, but to him who does not work, but believes in him who justifies. Uh, Romans 9. Not of works, but of him who calls. Uh, First Timothy, 2 Timothy 1. Not according to our works. And Titus 3. Not by works of righteousness. Like, you have to have all of these other verses go together. So the the... the the tax collector has no works and he knows it. He knows it because he's been told it by God. That was God's work. <laughs> and now he believes it. That's also God's work in him. Is he part of it? Yeah, he is. Cause he's the cart being pulled by the horse. Huh? And so God's work has woken him up. He does believe. Is there activity? Absolutely. Is he the source of it? No. And so how are you saved again by Jesus, not by Jesus plus you. Now, Jesus plus, I, I don't know. Have you ever read my book, Broken? I, I don't want you to, after I just yelled at you online, you know, I, I don't want you to have to go buy my book. But but if you're willing, I mean, the whole book's kind of written about this. 
There's that fly. He just he just buzzed me. It's like Maverick. Um, where did he come from? He was, was he sleeping in here? Yeah, I don't know. He was nowhere to be seen, and now he's so loud. Oh, there are two. two. <laughs> oh my goodness! Ah, I uh, swung my arm in a miss, and now it hurts. Um, my book Broken has got a whole section on Jesus Plus, and uh, how uh, you can do the math. Oh, I'll do the math right here. Here we go. So Jesus plus blank equals saved. All right. So on the screen. Oh, let's make it bigger here. Let's get. <laughs> Everybody can see, right? Um, on the screen, Jesus plus blank equals saved. It's written like a math equation, right? Now, I know not everyone likes math, but you got to solve for X here, right? <laughs> solve for X. Blank is X, right? So so what's the work that's going to save you? So we'll put the X there. And the way you solve for the equation is you subtract from both sides the amount that is a known, the known quantity, right? And so x equals saved minus Jesus. Hmm. It's that simple. It's that simple. Not by works, not by works, not by works, not by works. It just says it over and over again. And you're like, I, I'm going to insist on finding a verse that says something that I can re reconstruct to mean works. Why? Yeah, that was my question this whole time. Why? why? What is the purpose behind this, this deep dive? It was deep. It was a deep dive. So it it's like a it's like a philosophical thing, right? Because you the, we you're you're kind of trapped in the philosophy of justification right now, and um, at the end of the day, like like Jesus is your savior. Trust Jesus. But that's my work. Stop. No. You weren't created by him. You weren't redeemed. I mean, sorry. <laughs> you did not create yourself. You did not redeem yourself. You shall not sanctify yourself. He created you. He redeemed you. He is sanctifying you. And like the chief end of all of that is for you to say, he did it. I didn't do it. He did it. Praise be to him. Hallelujah. He did it. And you're like, but I did some of it. No, 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 no. Why? I'm sorry if I've confused you. It's never been my attempt. My, 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 my attempt. My Intention. intent. Intent. Yeah, never been my intent. All right. So there we are. That gets us through it for this week here on Stop the White Noise. And I, I don't mean to be. That's kind of a downer a little bit there at the end. <laughs> well, like, how do you? I mean, you were very good about going through the Bible and and sh pointing to all the verses. But in our our daily life, when we encounter people who continue to come back with kind of the same insistence, wh at what point and how do you say, you know what? Mm. Yeah. No. Well, like so, like <laughs> like I'm not even sure. The Roman Catholic Church would agree with the way he was saying it, but they, they might. So, like, if you really want to be a Roman Catholic, if you find that you are conscience-stricken to confess what the Roman Catholic Church teaches about justification being by works and Jesus, um, I mean, I, I just simply like, look, you're, you're evidently not a Lutheran. You're a Roman Catholic. Like, you're not doing anybody any favors. Mm-hmm. Your conscience is, is all over the place here. Now, you're going to, I'll tell you, you're going to go to a place, they're going to harden you in your conceit. And so by the time you die, for all I know, you won't even be a Christian. I don't think that's a good thing. But, you know, you're Jesus' sheep, not mine. So, so they don't hear. If the sheep idea. don't hear Jesus' voice, because this is such a key part of, of what salvation is. And yet we also know those Christians who manage to be inconsistent in this their entire life and, and not be destroyed. But like, mm -hmm. this is so key to what Jesus is, like, or what's how Christianity is. It's salvation. Mm -hmm. being saved not saving yourself like the idea that you save yourself is just nuts and he is pretty convinced that you must in order to complete the act mm -hmm. also have works you must bring the right act of contrition I mean that's, that's exactly how Rome would talk about you it you know too. it's interesting because when I was 
younger, um, I went with a friend of mine to a, they called themselves, oh, sorry. But all this is based on your assertion, not that the theory is right, but that the Bible says it. And I, I, I just, so my whole life I've been taught that the Bible doesn't say this. Or Bible says this, and now I find it doesn't say it. I just showed you seven places where it says it specifically. Okay, so mm. please continue. Um, it was a, a non-denominational church, they called themselves. And I remember going to Sunday school, and one of the questions was, what are you, and they would they sat all the little kids down, and we were probably 9, 10, 11. When you get to heaven... And St. Peter is there. What are you going to say in order for him to let you in? Right. Magic words. I, I was terrified because I didn't know. And mm. I didn't even know who St. Peter was mm -hmm. at the time. <laughs> I was like, what happened about to Jesus? Like, where? And there are gates that are locked and I'm not going to be able to. Why am I even in heaven? That's yeah, true, huh? <laughs> you know, right. Like, yeah. There, there's, wow. <laughs> Uh, so yeah, that was pretty terrifying. And that it reminded me that that stance that was being demonstrated kind of reminded me of that. So you have to know, like you said, the magic words. How are you? Ever, this and, is a problem that Roman Catholics do have. And it's why Roman Catholics never really know. If you talk to them, they, they rarely know that they're saved. They hope mm -hmm. they're saved. It's because you just, you just never know whether you've been humble enough. No, they all, in theory, I think if they know their stuff well enough, they know they're going to end up in purgatory, not hell. And so like that should make you feel good. You only got, you know, a couple thousand years of fire to, to wait through. Um, like you, this is the thing. It's like you, you're arguing like a Roman Catholic on this, but there's a whole lot more you're going to get picked up with that. And you want some Bible proofs on any of this stuff. It's like, come on, come on. Mm -hmm. um, so don't let Sola Scriptura send you to Rome because again, I gave you the very, very clear and evident answers. And your Bible verses that you quoted, your one from the the um, the Lord's Prayer, in a vacuum, if that was the only thing Jesus ever said, it could mean what you have it meaning. It's not the only thing he ever said. It's not the only thing in the New Testament it has taken with the entire New Testament. So it can't mean what you're having it mean because I just showed you seven verses that say the opposite of that in more specific terms. What does it mean? It means he wants you to forgive people. Like, and if you don't, like, you don't believe when he forgives you and that that's just it like you aren't you aren't understanding what it means to be forgiven mm -hmm. yeah um you don't believe now I, was, I will show you my works by what i do or sorry, my works i will show you my faith by what i do but i don't make my own faith and my faith is how i'm saved i'm saved into the faith into the faith i was dead i was an unbeliever now i'm a believer i'm saved now i will do things on the basis of the faith cart horse it's really simple there's a cart, there's a horse. Works with the cart. And it's good. Don't don't cut the cart off. You're in the cart. You know, if you the horse is pulling you along, you hack off the edges of the thing. You're gonna yeah, you're gonna sit there and, and fire. So just, you know, be glad that the the horse is pulling you. We gotta go get our kids, or one of us does. I was gonna go do it. Um, so I'm gonna tell you everybody else. Hey, if you like what we do, if you like what we do, please, we always do need your help. And you can do this at, uh, can I get it up there? Subscribestar.com slash RevFisk or Patreon.com slash RevFisk. Have you found a brief history of power? Um, maybe we'll put that one up here today. Hmm. A brief history of power.com, best podcast on the internet, puts you in context for what's going on right now as a Christian, gets you thinking outside the box of the, uh, what the, the rat wheel they got most of us thinking on and the sons of solomon uh prayer discipline worth ooh, i didn't know you could do that um uh, uh worth putting the psalms and proverbs into your life i promise you that a year of praying the same psalms and reading proverbs every day is going to change who you are for the better in the freedom that comes in jesus christ uh this is stop the white noise i'm jonathan and i'm meredith <laughs> swinging at the flies jesus christ is risen from the dead that means you have been paid for nothing to add to it that makes you immortal now that's a promise he's not going to be long anyway it's also a promise the water seals it that's a promise the food feeds it that's a promise you should join us that does involve you don't wallow in the muck with those who have no hope, but lift up your head all the more as you see the days approaching. Alleluia and rock on.
Or is that worth a dollar? Click the Patreon link in the show notes to sign up. Pretty please? <laughs>